being here in this morning and joining with us to our departmental session. As per today's agenda, uh, the very first item is the welcome address and introduction to the technical sessions. So I would cordially invite Dr. Udapadilianage, the head of the Department of Private and Comparative Law, in order to make the welcome address and introduction to the sessions. Madam, over to you. Thank you, Kaushani. A very good morning to all of you. Honorable judges of the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka, Justice uh, Isture Raja, President's Council, uh, Justice HMD Nawaz, uh, Justice Dr. Salim Masuf, President's Council, our keynote, uh, distinguished keynote speaker today, uh, Madam Vice Chancellor of the University of Colombo, Professor Ch Chandrika M. Vijayaratna, uh, Professor Indira Nanakara, Dean, Faculty of Law, Heads of Departments, uh, our distinguished invited panelists, Professor Embritas, Professor Sharias Carnival, uh, Professor Kamina uh, Gunaratna, uh, Professor S. Segaraja Singha, Chair of the Annual Symposium uh, 2020, uh, Senior Assistant Registrar, uh, Faculty of Law, presenters, colleagues, my dear students, and YouTube viewers. I warmly welcome you all to the annual academic sessions of the Department of Private and Comparative Law, Faculty of Law 2020. Indeed, I am pleased to organize this event with my members of the academic and non-academic staff this year on a new platform in which we are not very much familiar with. We should be grateful to the UCSC and the faculty for taking troubles in con converting on-site sessions to an online conference via Microsoft Teams amidst uh, COVID-19 pandemic. In a personal note, uh, we, the staff, wouldn't be able to meet physically uh, to discuss and plan the sessions given the situation, but managed to keep everything on track. Uh, we are online with a very short notice. We all are in an experimental stage, therefore I urge you all uh, to tolerate with us at the very beginning. If you come across any technical difficulty on our part, as well as on the part of distinguished panelists. I'm grateful to my team members as the head of the department for their tireless work around the club in past two weeks to make this event a success. I'm delighted to declare that the department has lined up 11 papers in three sessions to name law of dealing, labor law, and property and gender rights under the faculty theme of law at crossroads. Other than that, four papers will be presented by our colleagues in the commercial law and public law departmental sessions, depending on the relevance of their topics to those areas. I'm sure that uh, you will have a wonderful opportunity to improve your knowledge and critical thinking relating to private law aspects all day today. Without taking much time, I will open the forum for the sessions. I wish all the best for the presenters and a productive day for all of you. Thank you very much. Over to you, Kaushani. Thank you very much, dear madam. Uh, I would like to make a brief of the proceedings today. We have uh, three technical sessions of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. Session one is on DLIC law. We have three papers of the first session. Session two is on labor law. We have three papers uh, on labor law session. And we have uh, uh, technical session three on property law and gender rights. We have five, uh, five papers uh, for the technical session three. So we are giving 10 minutes of time for each presenter uh, first, and then next 10 minutes for the discussion at the same time. So we are going to start our first session, the daily close session now, and I will very briefly introduce the very distinguished members of the panel of our first session today. We have here Honorable Justice 
H.M.D. Nawaz and Professor Sharia Skarnival and Professor Kamena Gunaratna for our first session of Department of Private and Comparative Law. I would like to warmly welcome to our respective members of the panel. I would like to make a brief. Honorable Justice A.H.M.D. Nawaz, Honorable Justice of the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka, the former President of the Court of Appeal. Sir, warmly welcome to the session today. We have Professor Sharas Carnival, Emeritus Professor of Law, Faculty of Law, University of Colombo, and former Dean of Faculty of Law, and she served as former head of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. Her specializations are family law, labor law, customary law, child rights, and law of dealing. Dear Professor, we warmly welcome you to the session today. And Professor Kamina Gunaratna, head of the Department of Legal Studies, Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences of Open University of Sri Lanka. Professor Kamena's research specializations are environmental law, sustainable development, gender, social and economic rights, law of delict, and land law. Professor Kamena would like to warmly welcome you to the session today. So we have our first speaker today. Uh, Ms. Tushantika Kumar Surya. She is the senior lecturer of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. Her research interests are in law of delict, international investment law, law of contract, and insolvency law of child rights. And uh, today, Ms. Tushantika Kumar Surya, she is speaking on hold in the state libel of PO economic loss and analysis of the Sri Lankan law of delict. Mr. Shantika Kumar Surya, for this time for your presentation. Over to you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My research topic for today's session is holding the state liable for pure economic loss, an analysis of the Sri Lankan law of delict. The present research study is rested on two research questions, namely, why the state should be held liable for pure economic loss claims under the law of delict in Sri Lanka, and how the state could be held liable under the law of delict in Sri Lanka, Today's presentation is structured to report the key findings that I have gathered so far to resolve, the, uh, resolve those respective questions. Before moving into the analysis, let me explain the legal meaning of pure economic loss that is considered relevant in the present study. The pure economic loss refers to the monetary loss suffered unconnected to any injury to person or property. It could arise either by negligent acts or words. In Sri Lanka, it is evident that the pure economic losses that caught public attention arose as a result of the collapses of financial institutions. The list of such institutions includes Pramukha Bank, Golden Key, Bilagad the Finance Company, ETI Finance Limited, and Swarna Mahal Finance Services, PLC, etc. When those institutions collapsed, it was experienced that it emerged as a panic attack on the financial beneficiaries of those institutions. The country has witnessed the protest, pillars, and suicides of the disparate depositors. The Article 27.2b of the 1978 Constitution specifies that the state has a duty to maintain economic stability of the country. In terms of the sections 5 and 5a, 5a of the Monetary Law Act of number 58 of 1949 as amended, the Central Bank of Sri Lanka is entrusted with the legal duty to maintain the economic and financial stability of the country and thereby empower to supervise the financial institutions incorporated in Sri Lanka. 
Although the Monetary Board of the Central Bank has laid down rules and regulations to prevent the occurrences of the collapses of financial institutions, those incidents continue to happen. This pattern indicates that the state authorities have not been effective in implementing the necessary regulations. It also proves that the state actors find ways through the many loopholes that are in their favor to continue engaging in such unethical acts. In this context, the researcher believes that the legal system should devise a mechanism to have a check and balance over the discharge of state's duty to promote economic stability, which promotes accountability towards its people. Though in most cases, the state intervened to rectify the losses that were suffered by the depositors, the question as to whether the compensation and the relief provided by the state were adequate and satisfactory remain unaddressed. The common law right to remedy in the context of compensation should be in the form either to keep the claimant in the same status quo in which he should have been in if the detrimental act would have happened, or satisfying the claimant or the community's sense of justice. Examination of reliefs provided by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka for the affected depositors operated within the parameters of a... And there the judge... I, I forget his name. I was uh, com because the Roman Dutch law, his his name was a little long. Uh, he virtually conflated those two tests: the, the traditional test and the um, and the uh, uh, new approach test. Of course, she came out with uh, those two tests in her uh, in her paper, right? He um, conflated that, and then he he said um, uh, that uh, there must be a move towards. Uh, looking at them as uh, as one uh, one unifying test rather than looking at them separately. Uh, in fact, uh, if you will just look at the uh, the famous magazine uh, journal of the uh, journal uh, for contemporary Roman Dutch law uh, of 2020. I don't know whether you subscribe to that, uh, but uh, the 2020, um, 2020 uh, issue, issue number two, uh, right? Uh, issue number two of uh, of uh, of this famous journal, Journal for Contemporary Roman Dutch Law, should be uh, taken note of by us uh, come in the future, right? But, um, that's the comment that I can make on 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 the paper that you may uh, present. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Justice uh, H.M.D. Nawaz, sir. Thank you very much for your very valuable comments, and I hope it's very important to Mr. Shantika to develop your research. Now, uh, I would like to uh, uh, open the forum to Professor Sharaz Carnival, our Emeritus Professor of Law, to uh, make her valuable comments over to uh, Mr. Shantika's uh, presentation. Over to you, madam. Okay. Can you hear me? Sure, madam. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, very okay. clear. Okay. Uh, so, uh, because I know you're going, you're running into a time problems uh, with this session, and uh, so I'm going to just make one comment uh, for for uh, to Santika. Firstly, I'd like to say I'm so happy that the law of delict is alive and well in the Faculty of Law, even amidst this enormous pandemic. Uh, and with that, um, I'm just going on to uh, uh, make one comment for the because of uh, time constraints. Now, Tusantika, I see you have looked at a number of Sri Lankan cases, on the three Sri Lankan cases on PO economic loss. And what I'd like you to consider is because what you are suggesting is that we make a bit of a giant leap uh, into looking at uh, whether a breach of a legal duty by the state would be uh, actionable in dealing. So you're going really well beyond Chisel versus Chapman, People's Bank versus New Lanka Merchants and Jai Mohan. And I agree with you that it is absolutely essential given the uh, economic collapses, the financial collapses, etc., that we have witnessed that this matter uh, should you know move on to state uh, liability? My question is that the three cases that you looked at, did you really see that there was a reference to the South African principles as they have developed in uh, South Africa? Did you see that kind of in-depth uh, analysis of the South African um, cases? 
uh, and whether there is a likelihood of the Sri Lankan courts really drawing on the South African experience. Uh, the tendency of the Sri Lankan courts is to look at English law. Uh, and so are we going to see uh, this kind of in-depth analysis of South African law, which is really what you're suggesting that happens for this leap that uh, needs to be taken. Uh, so, and if, and if uh, you don't see that possibility of this kind of in-depth analysis of South African cases, uh, what would be the alternative? Uh, now, Justice Nawaz has said, of course, you can uh, look at English law. And uh, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not advocating that because I think this is an area in which uh, South African law should be uh, looked at because of the requirements of the acquitted action. Uh, but is that a possibility that the courts will look really at uh, precedents in English law in looking at this uh, question of uh, liability. Uh, and if not, if you don't see uh, these possibilities, what is the alternative uh, for Sri Lanka? Are you thinking in terms of some kind of uh, statutory uh, remedy, whatever? Because as you know, it has been quite frustrating for us, uh, those who uh, tend to look at South African law to see that that is really not the law that is really being looked at. But uh, with that comment, I will stop so, uh, for the, for, because of uh, time. But congratulations on this uh, thinking that has uh, gone into looking into this uh, area. And because uh, even if we don't see the kind of development we should be seeing in relation to peer economic loss, Still, we must continue thinking of how we are going to bring this into the law. We can't all give up, and certainly the academics can't give up. So, uh, so congratulations, and please look at how we can make this a reality in uh, Sri Lanka. I won't cover the extensive ground covered by uh, Justice uh, uh, Nawaz. I will just stop with that so as to be able to give the next speaker a chance, next presenter, a chance to present. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sharia. Uh, it's really, really important comments for Ms. Shantika. Thank you very much. And I would like to uh, open the discussion uh, with uh, Professor Kamena Gunaratna. Madam, Professor Kamena, over to you uh, to give uh, com uh, comments and suggestions to Ms. Shantika. Um, thank you. <clears throat> Kaushani, can you hear me? Yes, can you yes, hear? madam. Yes, yes, we can hear. Okay. Thank you, Tushantika, for a very interesting presentation. I'm sorry I missed a little because I had connection problems. I will also be extremely brief. Uh, now, uh, I think uh, this is a tra trend in the law faculty, which I find very interesting. I think another paper is also looking at this this intersection between public and private law in the area of delict, uh, and also following the trend led by the South African courts. Uh, but I was wondering whether uh, you should also look at it from the point of view of the public law. So very briefly, some of the questions I'm asking is, as Professor Sharia said, it's a big leap <clears throat> to transfer this into the law of delict. And uh, practically, uh, for a plaintiff, uh, maybe we should look at the um, uh, options of in a situation like this, uh, whether public law or private law would be the better option, because proving the elements of delict uh, is also not easy. And maybe under a reduction or a human rights or fundamental rights action, uh, if there is a better chance of um, arguing your case, uh, then a plaintiff might practically go for those options. So that might also be a good um, opportunity for you to analyze that issue, uh, looking at some of the cases that have been filed. As Justice Navas mentioned, the um, Golden Key was filed as a fundamental rights case, not as a delict case. Uh, 
of course, in a dealing case, you would get compensation, but you would also get that in a fundamental rights case. And at the end of the day, uh, it is for the courts to um, carry this forward and also consider these options. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is, uh, have you looked at the one, one of the few statutes we have in the area of delict, uh, which is the State Liability in Delict Act, and what role that particular piece of legislation might impact uh, on this question of, um, of basically what is state liability, right? And uh, you might just want to, it's a very brief act, not very long, but you might want to see whether there are any provisions there uh, which might uh, help your case. Uh, but one point I would like to make is that um, maybe the courts should now become open to this. As Professor Sharia said, our courts tend to look at English law, uh, but we do have this influence of South African law in the area of dealing. So, and the courts have said that, as Justice um, Mazuf, I believe, said uh, the, um, in, in the Rien Salakaratna case, the judges clearly said our delict action is founded in the Aquilian action and in the Roman Dutch law, in which case we do need to turn to the South African law. Uh, but also in the case of uh, writ applications, in the case of fundamental rights applications, uh, it would depend on the openness of the courts also uh, to start going in this direction. And maybe the trend set by the academics um, would also be helpful in that regard. So I will just stop with those uh, suggestions. Uh, as I think we are pretty much over time. But uh, thank you very much. I found it extremely interesting. Thank you very much, Professor Kamena Gunaratna. Thank you very much. The really valuable comments. And uh, we'll open the forum for the uh, uh, participants. Uh, if they have any question uh, or any suggestions regarding Ms. Tushantika's presentation. So you may uh, switch on. Uh, the click the button of the raise hand button here in the screen. If you have the participants, then you can voluntarily uh, speak at the session. Uh, thank you very much. So we are waiting uh, for the participants uh, 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 response response regarding this. So there's a raise hand button here. Uh, so you may click and ask the questions. Okay, uh, I think uh, so. I think I, I didn't receive any uh, response or even uh, to the chat box as well. So I checked it. Thank you very much. Thank you to Shantika. So I'm going to move into the next session, uh, next presentation from Ms. Ketmini Avirupola. She's the probationary lecturer of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. Her research interests are in health and medical law. So she's speaking today on living wills, a dilemma between patient's control over destiny versus doctor's position in choosing the lesser of the two evils. Ms. Kitmini, over to you. I hope uh, we can't uh, uh, 
hear her voice at the video. Just, just uh, give us a few minutes. Just give us. The living will be revoked. My name is Kitpini Averupala, and today I will be presenting my research under the topic on um, living wills. Under the topic on living will, a dilemma between patient's control over destiny versus the doctor's position in choosing the lesser of the two evils. Now, before moving to our discussion, I just wanted to give a brief uh, introduction as to what I will be talking about today. Now here, firstly, I would give an introduction to the topic, mainly what do you mean by a living will and what are the ideas that exist about living will. And then the secondly, I will be talking about the research analysis where that I would talk, be talking about uh, a series of questions as to how should doctors step in? When should doctors step in or step aside? How should doctors step aside in certain circumstances where there is a living will and you're going to act upon it? or not. So that's the second uh, issue that I'm going to talk about, which might take a lot of time to talk about. And a substantial portion of this uh, discussion would be based on that. And then the third is the recommendation sections where that I will be talking about certain recommendations as to how to better this position. And in conclusion, I would try to analyze the viability of living wills uh, as a mechanism in responding to uh, a first patient's request of dignified death. Now, in moving ahead with the introduction, firstly, we have to clarify what a living will is. Now, this is a directive that's given by a patient to its families and physicians, acknowledging the person's preference for a dignified death in circumstances where there's no hope of recovery remains, right? You're trying to go ahead with a request a dignified death as opposed to uh, a death uh, that, uh, as opposed to one where that you are kept longer by life-sustaining measures, by artificial law, mecha mechanical prolongation of life. You're rejecting that and you're requesting for a dignified death when there's no hope of recovery remains. So that is pretty much what we call, by, call as uh, living wills. There exist nebulous, very different interpretations to living wills, but throughout this research, the interpretation that I have followed or rather like to acquire is that living will is not a document that's merely designed to end life, but it's rather uh, a, a document that enables the individuals to control their own medical destiny. It's not about that you are ending life. It could be where that you are uh, expanding your future treatment or where you are restricting your future treatment. It in no way be recognized as a document that uh, that's designed to end life. Right. So it enables the individuals to control their medical destiny, either to have more care or less care. And then you can request for a dignified death rather than being on machines. Now, there exist different views. Some are positive, some are negative. So some people believe that living wills are uh, living wills keep patients frequently alive beyond the, dicta beyond the point that's dictated by humane medical practice. It's not what is uh, humane, but that's beyond the uh, point that's dictated by humane medical practice. And some also perceive living wills as, um, as where the patients would be kept on life support systems in a sense that the patients become prisoners of medical technology because you know that the technology exists and you have the option, then what you basically do is you become prisoners of medical technology. Now, moving on, when it comes to English, there are certain issues to be clarified. Now, what if in instances where the doctor ignores the patient's desire, ignores the living will and treats the patient, that's contrary to the patient's desire. Now, in this instance, there are, there, uh, there are possible questions that may arose. One thing is, will the doctor be held liable for assault? Or will the doctor be held liable for battery? Because you have given a consent, but you are acting against or contrary to the interest of the doctor, uh, interest of the patient. So what would happen, right? And in these circumstances, like in, in a circumstance where the person is at the ICU and is incompetent, what is the proper practice that's expected of a reasonable doctor, whether to comply with the living will or ignore the living will. And on the other hand, is it also appropriate of a reasonable doctor in these circumstances to have acted against or contrary to the patient's desire? So these are some potential problems that may occur in any event if the doctor ignores the living will. On the other hand, 
what if the doctor acquiesces to the patient's demands and abstains from necessary treatment? You comply with it, even if you don't want to, because the, that's the patient's desire, you comply with it. In such instances, whether the doctor again be civilly or criminally held liable, because he failed to prove, provide the necessary treatment, and as a result of that, it might be perceived as the person died. So in such instances, what would happen? Now, these are the grueling circumstances and questions that I wanted to deal with throughout this research in suggesting a proper legislation, uh, listing down the, as a guideline how the doctors should act in certain instances. Now, the observation that I came into when analyzing the whole two, uh, what if they ignore and what if they quizzes is that doubtless that the doctor will be responsible in this in instance for failing to fulfill the uh, duty of care that's expected of a reasonable person. So this shows that the doctor has to be in a situation where there's a rock and the hard place and the doctor, whatever the decision that the doctor takes, the doctor has to uh, certainly face very uh, unfortunate circumstances. Either the doctor will be here liable according to um, according to the law because the doctor did not perform the functions uh, according to what the doctors are supposed to and therefore breach the duty of care. And on the other hand, that the doctor will be either held liable for assault or battery because the patient had given a certain type of a treatment, but you uh, went against that. You did not comply with that. So these are the circumstances that I wanted to highlight. Again, another important uh, aspect that I wanted to highlight throughout this research is, yes, true, living wills restrict or expand individuals' future treatment, but there exists a lot of practical issues that remain unresolved. The issue one that I wanted to highlight was, living wills can be only be executed by certain persons who have the capacity, because the law prefers uh, competency than incompetency, and then the law prefers sanity than insanity. Now, the problem is, will this capacity be adjust, adjudged the same when the person uh, subsequently becomes incompetent? Right Now, at the point of writing, you're conscious, but subsequently you become unconscious or incompetent. And all later, as a result of the medical condition, the patient becomes uh, incompetent. In that sense, will you judge the capacity as same when that the person wrote or like prefer, uh, prepared the living will and at which stage that you consider the living will be revoked without having the patient to revoke it himself or herself now that's one question that is uh, very important to be looked at when it comes to living means and the second thing is how do you define competency do you define competency as a person's mental capacity to understand or uh, whether a person literally comprehends what's before him or not, because whichever the interpretation that you follow, it might have different consequences. And the third issue that I wanted to particularly highlight is whether now the person is uh, after diagnosed with an illness, the person is writing a living will. Whether that living will be a true interest or uh, the desire of a patient because when you get to know about a particular uh, stage or uh, about a particular illness, you're writing a living will, and that living will would be influenced by uh, doctor's instructions, financial incapacities, and even uh, family pressure. Whether that would be a true desire of a patient is also another question. Now, the third issue in this regard is how a person who's healthy today would predict their desire when they are at a devastated situation. And also, what seems impossible today might be possible when you are actually faced in the issue. So then in that instance, how do you consider the living will to be revoked or not, right? So these are some practical issues there that exist when it comes to living wills. Now, this in this slide, I just focus on the doctor's liability. Now, the first issue is when there is a, a patient in the intensive care unit, and there's a life-threatening situation, but the patient in the living will has denied treatment. In that situation, how should the doctor act? Whether the doctor should comply with the living will or whether the doctor should trust the medical technology and the medical science and then uh, treat the patient or not. And what would the liability in such circumstances be? The second is, if the patient is unconscious and the doctor cannot ensure whether this person's desire at the moment remains the same as when he actually wrote the living will, can we assume that the doctor uh, has the implied consent to act positively or not? So that's another issue. And the third issue that I wanted to highlight is, 
Is it possible in any event to assume that the patient's desire is superseded by the emergency condition because the person is it has, he's at intensive care unit? Can you predict or assume that the patient's desire is superseded by the emergency situation or not? If so, whether the doctor would be held liable for superseding the patient's desire? And also, if the living will is given effect to, would that be considered as a breach of duty of care? Now, whichever the option that's followed, you can see that the doctor is caught up between these two unforeseeable yet life death depending circumstances and the doctor has to choose the lesser of the two evils. What is even more unfortunate is that choosing the lesser of the two evils would not be any escapism for liability because the law is not clear with regards to this. The law is learned and the doctor would have to face consequences following whichever the option that it is. Therefore, that I've suggested, gave several certain suggestions with regards to this. One is that the approach of distributive justice, because that means that equal sharing of uh, resources among everyone. In any event, if the person, uh, if, if, in any event, uh, if the person uh, should be treated, uh, I mean, now you're treating a person, but you're depriving others of greater benefit. In such instances, that you can actually adopt uh, the distribute concept of distributive justice. The second is the formulation of a legislation that explicitly states the instances where a doctor could supersede the patient's desire. For example, when the person is at a critical stage, the person is incompetent to make a decision, so the doctors should be able to take a decision on behalf of the patient for the best interest of the uh, for the best interest of the patient. If the patient has a minor or an unborn child, then then you should uh, you should give the benefit of the doubt and act accordingly. And the third instance is in the event where there is a possibility that this liability will follow if hospital did not act or take prompt action. And those instances are important. And the third is when there are risk benefit uh, decisions uh, ought to be taken by ICUs, uh, clinicians at ICUs, the principle of non-maleficence, non that means you should not harm when you are deciding that's likely to cause more harm than good. If you are deciding a treatment, when you are deciding the treatment, if that treatment is likely to cause more harm than good, then you should avoid that. So that principle of non-maleficence would also be important in this regard. And the formation of a legislation that explicitly states the requirements and procedure. Now, this I have prepared basically by going through uh, by going through the USA's and its statutory response, and I'm more than happy to answer any of the questions. And since the time has already already lapsed, I prefer to uh, I prefer to answer any of the questions that panelists and every uh, attendee has. So thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kitmini Avirupala, for the very interesting presentation today. I mm -hmm. uh, would like to uh, open the forum for our distinguished uh, members of the panel for uh, their uh, valuable comments and suggestions to regarding uh, the presentation of Ms. Kitmini. Uh, Sir, uh, Honorable Justice uh, HMD Nawaz, Sir, so the first uh, we would like to hear for you. Yes, yeah. later. Uh, I, I think, uh, can you hear me, right? Uh, you can hear me, right? Um, yes, yes. Sir, yes. Uh, so, so uh, I think the um, uh, it it became a hit. Uh, I think the living wheels, the concept of living wheels, uh, was uh, raging in the in the West at some point. Uh, and today, I, I must uh, sound a little bit of uh, uh, caveat at the moment. Uh, it is is it is on the vein. Uh, um, uh, because of the uh, statutory inroads or innovations that have been made uh, in recent times. Uh, now, uh, of course, she mm, uh, highlighted some some uh, some concerns uh, which which have been identified. Now, now uh, take for instance, uh, um, uh, when you when you have a living will. Uh, now it's virtually a will. Uh, um, uh, so the, so so the wills. Uh, well, have to be given effect to. Uh, so then, if he had said uh, at seventy-four, uh, well, well, my my heart. St if my heart stops, right, don't resuscitate my heart, right. Uh, you you stop my heart. If if he has stated so, then uh, then she she posed the question, right. Uh, come uh, now, whether 
we have to give effect to that because there, there's a text there. There can because the courts can't uh, uh, even if it is presented before a court. I, I'm just uh, thinking aloud. I'm not. I'm not saying uh, that that dilemma uh, is there. That dilemma of uh, of of a text uh, lying in front, a, a very authoritative, uh, come uh, advanced decision taken by him, uh, right? And then the doctor. Uh, being confronted with uh, this decision. Uh, well, in a situation of that nature, uh, the doctor, of course, uh, may have a treatment which might uh, revive him, which might uh, revive him, but the, but, the, but, the, but the text says otherwise. So, so now you can see the dangers of, uh, um, uh, as she rightly pointed out, uh, there are inherent dangers in having, in leaving a living will, uh, which is sometimes uh, called uh, uh, durable will or whatever, because in American uh, jurisdictions uh, they they call it uh, the durable will, or, or, or in the U in the UK um, uh, they they call it the living will. So that's number one. But but they, they, and and mind you, uh, um, uh, it is contextual. Now you see uh, now now at seventy four, as I said. Uh, he might think, at, uh, when he writes the living will, he might say, uh, right at 74, uh, come, uh, I might, uh, but he, suppose he writes it at 54. He, he, he may not write that if my heart uh, stops, uh, 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 don't revive me. Uh, he may not write it at 54, but uh, he might uh, say so when he writes it at, uh, at the age of 84 or 90, you can uh, write so. Now you can see the uncertainties of leaving a living will because a living will gives rise to uncertainties. Uh, come, uh, and I'm picking on what you said. I'm picking on what you said uh, from uh, what you. Um, so uh, when if, when a living will leaves uncertainties of this nature, right? Uh, it is contextual. He has to be quite precise about it, right? Because he can't foresee what will happen at. Uh, at uh, come, come, there is no foreseeable certainty which is uh, which he can uh, foretell with some kind of uh, unerring accuracy uh, from, uh, confronted with some kind of ailment. So therefore, in, uh, the, uh, I will be least reluctant, uh, or rather, I, I won't be uh, in favor of uh, of uh, of this concept of uh, living will. Um, and more than that, more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, you also raised this question. Now, uh, when a doctor is placed on the horns of a dilemma as between a last uh, living will and uh, a decision that he has to make, what does he do? I, I, I'm, I'm just thinking of a, of a very dear friend of mine. I don't want to come out with his name. He's well known, right? Uh, and uh, he recently uh, suffered a very, a very, very... Um, um, damaging kind of uh, uh, ailment, uh, he's lying uh, in, uh, um, so he has not left the living will, right? Uh, um, uh, now, uh, the doctors uh, um, uh, are in a dilemma as to whether they can, they must take the machine off or they must uh, uh, continue the uh, ventilation. Uh, so in such a situation, right, uh, even if he has left the uh, living will he is quite young he is about uh, 65 now so 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 now i won't say that at 65 uh, you 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 are ready to die or, or with this kind of physique that he had but but uh, a living will in such a situation with his knowledge would have been the least uh, kind of uh, advice that i would have given him because uh, they come in such a situation now now look at the kind of uh, actors who are walking into his life the spouse uh, or rather uh, the, the children they they come and uh, can they come and now if he has left a living will uh, if i am on a on, at a point of death you must take the uh, machine off can they come and say no don't take the machine off right continue the treatment can they come and uh, come? so that really impinches on the consent, the reality of consent. Who can give consent, right? The, the law of consent is not, is not um, uh, that, that you can substitute uh, for my consent. An adult, uh, right, uh, is competent to give consent, right? 
so the, the wife or children, uh, I don't think the law of consent uh, goes to the extent of transferring uh, the consent uh, to them in a stage where I am not competent uh, to come. So, so there is this dilemma whether we can give effect to this. Uh, in fact, I must tell you, um, having looked at it, uh, there are statutory reforms to do to this uh, come, uh, e e abroad. I, I have, uh, I can uh, give you uh, something that United Kingdom uh, did in the year 2000, or rather, is it in 2008? They passed fundamental uh, uh, capacity act in 2005, uh, right? Uh, uh, they clearly defined uh, what capacity means. Now, you posed that question uh, as well, right? Uh, there are criteria. A doctor, has, if he visits a patient, right, he must, um, uh, he must see whether the patient understands the information. He must see whether the patient retains that information. He must see whether the patient uses and where that information. And you, you must see whether uh, he can communicate after having weighed and used, whether he can communicate back to the doctor, right? Uh, only if those criteria are satisfied, uh, the English law says uh, he can call him uh, to be having the capacity or having competence, right? This is exactly what happened in the famous Montgomery case, right, uh, which is today uh, now, uh, Lady Brenda Hale, I, was it? Yeah, she's retired, and, and she wrote a fantastic judgment in family law. Uh, they, they, this was a pregnant lady, right? Uh, come, and uh, she uh, did not consent to a particular procedure, so it was a childbirth, and then the court finally said, the court said she should have been asked. Uh, come, she should have been, um, now, Mia giving a, Giving a written consent on a piece of paper is not enough. Now, now see, we are paternalistic. Uh, we look upon our doctors uh, as solicitors and, and you know, come, uh, mama balaganang. That's how the doctors say to us. We, uh, we, uh, we virtually uh, take upon uh, what they say. That's not how law looks at it. Uh, um, they have to first ascertain the capacity, and then thereafter, uh, if the capacity is not there, then come then what do they do uh, right what do they do they can they consult uh, come but I'm, I'm moving away from your last will uh, living uh, will uh, concept now now I, I have I'm a little doubtful about it because you yourself have highlighted a lot of uh, 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 issues right so if you move away from that abroad uh, they have what is called LPAs LPAs in other words, uh, living, uh, no, uh, lasting power of attorney held, or lasting power of attorney uh, from, uh, for finance, LPS. You must explore that uh, concept uh, for Sri Lanka. I think um, your paper will be incomplete if you do not, uh, you not consider LPS, which have now developed in many parts of the world. LPA, in a sense, I live a, a lasting power of attorney. In that power of attorney, I nominate my brother, my brother in Sri Lanka knows much more than my brother in the UK knows about me. So uh, I won't nominate my brother in the UK. I will rather nominate my brother here uh, to, to do what he should do when I am terminally uh, ill. So LPS uh, have taken over last wheels now, uh, living uh, wheels now. So in LPS, you transfer the consent. You transfer the consent because adults can't. Uh, come. The wife can't come and say, no, 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 you do this and all that. No. Uh, if there is no living will, wife can't force her consent on, uh, for a treatment. Uh, come, uh, in fact, the American courts have said, if you don't give effect to uh, the consent on the part of a patient, you are really violating the First Amendment, uh, come, uh, they said. Uh, come. So, so, now, uh, come, uh, so now LPS allows you uh, to nominate somebody who can give consent on my behalf. Right. So, uh, so now uh, come. Uh, I'm told recently. I read somewhere. Uh, doctors ask uh, come uh, very agile elderly patients. Uh, what do you like to leave behind? Uh, do you like to leave behind uh, an LPA finance or LPA uh, come health? They will uh, prefer LPA 
that come held and not financed. So they don't want to leave their finance to their spouses. So now I think we should move towards uh, that regime, statutory regime, where uh, come, uh, this is brought in. And then, um, and, and, you, know, uh, I, you know, in a situation where there is no last bill, right, or living bill, then there is no LPA, uh, right, giving consent to the wife or brother to decide the, um, then, uh, then uh, they go to the go, go to the uh, clinicians. And now we, they don't call them doctors. The clinicians have a meeting. They they just take on board the views of the wife and children, right? Now I'm I'm just thinking of now when I read your paper, I was thinking of my bro, uh, friend who is today lying in the intensive care unit with with uh, consciousness gone, right? Uh, so the wife is wanting uh, come uh, the the you no know, living will, right? No LPA. Right, uh, come, but but I will also sound. Uh, you can't have these innovations in Sri Lanka unless there is a statutory regime for this, huh? Right, you can, uh, you have to have this supported by a legal regime. You can't just uh, come, come, but good that you expressed into this area rather uh, come uh, with innovations. But then uh, come, so so now she's saying, I'm told, uh, come come right, take off. No. Right, the doctors have to make that decision. The doctors have to make that decision. Right, you can, they have to go into a meeting and take that decision. So that's the law. That's how it has developed today. And if the doctor and the uh, family members have some variance of views, then uh, they refer the matter to what is called a court of protection, which is usually the high court court of protection. Right. So I think that's the way to go down. In my view, if you explore LPAs. Uh, write your paper will be uh, more uh, complete in my view. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Justice Nawaz, uh, sir, for your valuable comments. Uh, over to Ms. Kitmini Avirupala. Uh, I would like to, uh, Ms. Kitmini, do you need to tell anything? Uh, no. Uh, you have anything today? No, okay. So I would like to uh, go to Professor Shares Carnival, madam. Uh, uh, we're waiting for your comments regarding Ms. Kitmini's presentation. Okay, once again, I'm going to uh, just, uh, you know, give one or two points for Kitmini uh, to consider because of the time uh, time constraints. Uh, now, uh, my, my, my comment, of course, follows from what Justice uh, Nawaz said. I, I really don't think that within the current framework, uh, this concept of a living will uh, can be accommodated. That, of course, doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking at it because uh, really it's raising a, a lot of important uh, issues, you know, the right of dignity, the all of that, you know, to be able to control your destiny, all of these things uh, come into this concept. But, um, the way I see it, uh, you know, within the current fairly developed framework on uh, medical negligence, I can't really see how the medical uh, practitioner could be uh, protected. Uh, I think you have to look at whether there are any existing principles uh, that can be used to protect uh, the medical practitioner. I don't know whether you would have to look even at volenti. I'm not uh, very certain, but it might be something you might have to uh, to look at. And I'm also wondering how feasible it is uh, to use principles relating to wills in this area, because then we would be using really the wills ordinance and the prevention of uh, frauds ordinance, and which never visualized this kind of will. So therefore, you're not going to find in the wills ordinance uh, anything that can really cater for a living will, because it was not really in the realms of uh, the thinking of the drafters of the wills ordinance. You're going to find very limited uh, help in the wills ordinance. I really do not see um, any possibility except a statutory uh, framework and even the lasting power of attorney that Justice Nawaz spoke about, 
We might even have to change our thinking in relation to powers of attorney and instruments dealing with the powers of attorney to accommodate this concept. Because I think if we go to a lawyer and we start, you know, wanting to put a clause like this into the power of attorney, we will have problem there as well. So we, we are in fact thinking of a completely new regime that we will have to think of. I, I'm not sure that within this currently developed regime, we can really accommodate that. <clears throat> I think you have to look, I'm sorry about my throat. I think you will have to look uh, at comparative uh, materials as well, you know, fairly uh, significantly, case law, things like that. Uh, even if you're going to develop a kind of statutory regime, I think you have to uh, give pointers as you have done really to some extent on what are the factors that will have to be uh, looked upon. If, uh, to Santika's paper was a sort of giant leap. This is a leap into the unknown. So uh, we really have to um, formulate, uh, we have to look uh, very carefully at the kind of regime that we'll have to uh, put in place. I don't see much hope within the wills ordinance or really even the law of medical negligence as it has uh, developed up to now. I can't see exceptions that have come in. That is, of course, not to say not that is not to say that you shouldn't be looking at this, but we have to look at this. Uh, I'm not sure how, to what extent the confines of the law of delict as it has developed up to now will help you. So go, have to go beyond the the framework. But let's go beyond. It's fun to go beyond, I think. So let's uh, uh, try and go beyond because this is what we want to see. We don't want uh, the law of delict to remain uh, 18th, uh, 17th and 18th century Roman Dutch law. So we want to use the Roman Dutch law, but we have to also understand that there are certain constraints uh, in using a older system uh, of law. So sometimes you just have to make that leap. And uh, let's well make that leap, Kitmini, give the legislators something to think about. Uh, they should be doing some thinking, I think. So let's do that all together. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Shahraz Carnival. Thank you very much, Madam, for the really valuable comments to Ms. Kitwini. And uh, I would like to uh, listen to Professor Kamina Gunaratna. Madam, uh, over to you regarding Ms. Kitwini Avarupala's presentation. Okay, thank you, Kashani. You can hear yes. me, right? Yes, madam. Yes, oh. sure. Okay. Uh, Kitmini, I really like your presentation. And I think you are now pioneering a very new area of law. And I think I would take a rather more radical approach than Justice Nawaz and Professor Sharia. Um, and I think um, for an academic kind of researcher to carry this forward would be really good. Now, let me say that I have talked to Dr. Friends about this, and I think this is a conversation that is taking place among the medical profession also, uh, related to the way in Sri Lanka, doctors tend to prolong life uh, when life has also become meaningless. And uh, really, it's more existence than life. And so obviously, from living wills, the next radical step would be assisted suicide, which I personally absolutely don't advocate. Uh, but the whole question of unduly prolonging life is a difficult problem. Uh, now, um, I have also been told that particularly in the private health sector, this is done, you know, uh, to well, for commercial purposes. And I personally know people are put on ventilators because the hourly cost of a ventilator is horrendous. Till finally the family has to say, you know, uh, remove the ventilator, just let them go. So I think this is a very pertinent thing. Uh, now, I think the pioneering jurisdiction for this is the US, which has always been very radical on medical law. 
and I believe in the U.S., it is actually an offense for a doctor, for example, to violate a do not resuscitate order. And the doctor can be legally liable, ironically, if they revive a patient. And, you know, another example of that is a friend of mine uh, whose mother was in a coma uh, with no chance of coming out. Uh, was actually very upset because when the mother had a heart attack twice, doctors revived her and prolonged her life for a few more months uh, to absolutely no purpose. So I think this is a conversation that is probably long overdue. Uh, but as Professor Shari and Justice Nava said, we have to tread very carefully. In this country, we are going to be looking at religious issues and ethical issues also and cultural issues. Uh, but I think you are really pioneering, pioneering a very interesting area of law. I would also like to raise the issue of the lasting power of attorney. Uh, because Kitmini, in your, in your paper, you were looking more at people who are physically debilitated. But now we are also looking at another situation where because of uh, the lifespan of people is, you know, getting longer and longer. As a result, we have a big problem of dementia. And when a person starts on that road, uh, then they completely lose autonomy. Uh, their property rights go, somebody has to take over. So there are issues of whether, say, I even at my age now, can write a lasting power of attorney. And at this point, I can say, okay, if I ever get dementia, this is the person I want to take decisions for me, to take over property, uh, to take medical decisions, right? So I think these are also kind of related. And maybe this is another side issue of this, maybe not a side issue, another aspect of this uh, that you can also look at. And yes, I agree, it requires legislative enactment. This is not something the courts can decide on. Uh, but maybe we could push for a very carefully crafted um, set of legislation to address these issues. Because now with longer life, uh, these are issues that are going to come into play. Uh, the other thing I think you may need to look at is not only the role of the doctor, but also the role of the family. And when there is a dispute between the doctor and the family over a patient, and there have been many well-known cases in the UK, for instance, uh, where doctors wanted to, over a child, a, young, a small child, uh, where the doctor said, uh, let the child go let the child die peacefully and the parents fought and said, no, we want to keep treating because obviously patients, uh, the parents do not want to let their child go so easily. And these things have gone to court in those countries. And it is very likely that a case like this might even come to court in Sri Lanka. And in those countries, the, uh, the balance of authority seem to be with the doctors rather than with the parents or the family. So uh, I'm not sort of uh, trying to uh, say how it should be, uh, but what I am saying is that you have embarked on a really innovative and novel area, uh, which I think uh, probably requires uh, research, uh, you could go into extensive research on this. You could come out with some policy options. So congratulations. I found your paper really quite exciting. And I do hope you will carry this forward because I think it is something uh, that Sri Lanka should not get left behind uh, with privatization of medicine, uh, with prolonged life, with all the consequences that go with all that. Um, it will be very interesting. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear Professor. Thank you very much for your valuable comments regarding Ms. Kitmini Abirupala's presentation. Now uh, we are moving to the next presentation. Uh, next presentation uh, is uh, on negligence, 
an adequate basis of liability in a pandemic situation by Dr. Udapadile. And again, let me uh, give a brief uh, uh, introduction to our madam. Uh, Dr. Udapadile, she is our head of the Department of Private and Comparative Law, and she is the senior lecturer of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. Her uh, research specializations are in law of delict, law of insurance, and environment law. Dear Madam, over to you for your presentation. Very good morning to you. Uh, my presentation is yet another piece of work on law of delict. Uh, it is considering uh, whether negligence can be retained as a basis of liability uh, in delict in a pandemic situation or whether any transformation is needed. When studying into the background, uh, it was noted that uh, negligent acts and omissions uh, of the persons are on the increase uh, in a pandemic. Consequently, uh, pandemic litigation may also increase in future. Uh, thus, it is questioned whether uh, the injuries and losses should be considered exceptionally uh, given the situation or the general law is adequate to deal with uh, the problem. The most uh, important issues relating to pandemics are given here. Among them, professionals' liability, uh, employers' liability, uh, to compare COVID-19 uh, situation with other deadly infectious diseases, uh, personal injury litigation, products liability, uh, and on the other hand, state liability for failure to control COVID-19 uh, and also uh, evidentiary issues relating to various cases, uh, criminal and civil liability issues, uh, plus Sri Lankan regime to deal with uh, the matters are uh, prominent. In particular, uh, the liability of persons, uh, those who are doing pressing jobs, such as doctors, health officers, volunteers uh, and rescuers are given more focus. In this backdrop, uh, the research problem uh, of this study is why negligence should be retained as the basis of liability despite the evolution of strict liability in the modern legal regimes. Uh, the hypothesis uh, which is going to be tested uh, is whether strict liability is the most appropriate uh, liability basis to deal with the issue of uh, pandemic uh, to balance the rights of uh, the parties in a future case. Uh, the study involves several objectives. The main objective is to examine the scope of uh, negligence in delete. Uh, there are specific objectives such as uh, to study uh, the impact of negligence as the basis of liability, uh, to conduct a comparative study on South Africa and uh, the USA, and to examine the comparative value of negligence as against strict liability in a pandemic scenario, and finally to recommend uh, policy improvements uh, to the area of negligence to face future litigation. Uh, in, this is a qualitative and comparative study uh, which involves primary and secondary data. The study uh, involves a design limitation uh, in which the researcher is debarred from accessing to field data given the COVID-19 situation. Therefore, it doesn't use face-to-face -face interviews or field data for the analysis. Uh, when it comes to the discussion 
uh, it is important to know the main uh, law relating to pandemics in Sri Lanka. Uh, it is the Quarantine and Prevention of Diseases Ordinance of 1897. This brings criminal liability of the offenders and the ordinance must be read with uh, other criminal uh, liability statutes. In this, section 13 is very important uh, because it gives a wider meaning uh, to uh, the word disease. When it comes to uh, the delictual regime, negligence is tested uh, in Sri Lanka separately from unlawfulness to evident factual scenario in an objective manner using the reasonable man's test. On the other hand, Strict liability does not consider mental element of the doer, but it imposes liability depending on seriousness of the harm. Because of this, some argue that uh, strict liability unnecessarily burdens uh, defendants, uh, especially those who are doing pressing jobs. In Sri Lanka, uh, the basis of liability uh, is negligence. And in that, foreseeability is promoted and practiced. Comparatively, uh, in South Africa, uh, the same test is used, though equal weight is given uh, to foreseeability and preventability of the damage, which is a significant yardstick in a pandemic situation. Even though the damage can be foreseeable in a given case, still the liability uh, can be controlled depending on the preventability. Thus, it will make a fair balance between the rights of the defendant and the plaintiff uh, in a case um, of a delictual uh, harm. Meanwhile, in the USA, preventability makes a general obligation of the contagious persons. Also, degree of care depends on the character of the infection and the danger that it carries to the community. Therefore, it is concluded that established action for negligence uh, can be used to deal with uh, pandemic issues with a flexibility rather than imposing strong, a strict liability without testing guilty mind. Finally, it can be recommended uh, to modify reasonable man's test uh, in view of uh, Sri Lankan law, giving special reference to preventability of the damage uh, with foreseeability in a sense of balancing computing interests of uh, the various parties in a case of a pandemic situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Udapadile uh, uh, Dear Madam, uh, it's a really very interesting presentation. And uh, I uh, move into the discussion of our distinguished uh, members of the panel. Uh, first, I would like to uh, invite uh, our Honorable Justice Nawasa, sir, uh, for your uh, comments and waiting for uh, waiting, uh, Madam uh, Dr. Lianagay for your comments. Thank you. Yeah, I think Udapadi has uh, has uh, hit the nail on the head by uh, choosing a topic which is very very pertinent in today's context. And uh, and uh, um, well, uh, well, you um, um, acknowledge the fact that negligence forms uh, uh, the basic fulcrum on which uh, we decide uh, um, decide. Uh, Tortious liability or delictual liability in the country. So then, then uh, you also uh, say that uh, foreseeability must uh, must uh, also incorporate uh, preventability. Well, uh, well, uh, I think uh, the the moment uh, the, uh, now you you identified a couple of uh, defendants who could be brought to court. Now you you talked about an employer. Employer liability, definitely. The employer can be brought to court, uh, right? Uh, now, uh, so if he is brought to court, uh, the, now, of course, he wouldn't have been brought to court in uh, in February, right? Now, in February, he knew little, right? Uh, and now, 
uh, he knows more. He knows more. So, so, so a claimant uh, in a current situation uh, who is affected in the workplace would be able to show that uh, that in April, when I was afflicted with COVID, my employer was sufficiently suffused with knowledge of the dangers, right? And he did not provide uh, enough PPAs. He did not provide uh, a good working environment. So this is what a judge in the district court, a trial judge, will look for when, a, when an employee is sued uh, by an employee in a COVID kind of uh, COVID-related um, thought. Uh, so, so, the, so finally, it all uh, depends. Uh, did you knowingly spread it? Did you uh, unknowingly spread it? Or you, by having poor safety measures at work, uh, you did you endanger uh, the staff? Uh, so now, well, uh, now uh, th there are situations uh, we hear uh, abroad. Uh, now, even in a hospital, the frontline workers, the doctors, all of them are provided with PPEs and all that. But then sometimes they are 20 of them are uh, taken into a come, single common room and then you crowd them around. Uh, come, uh, come. So despite providing them with, uh, with that kind of uh, PPEs and uh, a very good working environment, the fact that you, you provided them a single common room where they can go and rest, that will militate against uh, come, uh, uh, his uh, discharging uh, the standard of care uh, that he has to discharge. Come. So, so finally, uh, I, I would say, I would say, uh, working on the template that you have provided, right? Uh, if the claimant is able to establish uh, the duty of care and then uh, the, the causative elements and the, um, all, all that is there, definitely the employer will be a company. If he can establish. Right uh, now, uh, that he took all these measures. Now, say he can't say that uh, uh, I ensured a PCR test. Uh, he his mere ipsissima verba in court that I ordered a PCR test won't suffice uh, come to a judge. Uh, come, he must prove records. He must establish uh, that uh, he ensured. Uh, the PCR records are maintained. You know, I'm, I'm working, working on the template that you have provided. So that's how, uh, in the future, the preventability uh, can be addressed even within the concept of foreseeability that you spoke of, right? Uh, come, so that is one way of uh, doing it. I, I must now uh, also tell you, I must uh, also, also tell you, now we have this uh, vaccine that has been uh, developed by Pfizer, and then uh, so now, uh, now, now, if a doctor or or an or an institution is going to give it to uh, uh, an employee or a patient, right? Then the question of uh, consent comes in, uh, established in uh, uh, in in that uh, Montgomery uh, decision in in in, in the right. In other words, you have to put it in. Do you want to take this medicine? Uh, do you want to take this? Uh, come, uh, right. If he doesn't consent, and then you force him to uh, take it, uh, right? Uh, you might fall foul of uh, uh, the, the the autonomy infringement. Uh, come, uh, come. Uh, so those are issues uh, that your paper definitely raises, in my view. And uh, on those lines, if you can, um, uh, uh, you can uh, come. Uh, go. That will be a a great uh, come. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, uh, if he dies in the workplace, then recently they have gone and charged somebody with corporate manslaughter. I must tell you, uh, right <laughs> on the basis that it was a, a hotel which did not have any kind of working environment. So, if corporate criminal liability can be enforced, definitely a intellectual liability will be open. Uh, so, it's it's a good paper, very very thought provoking um, topic that you chose. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Justice uh, H.M.D. Nawaz. Sir, thank you very much for your valuable comments. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, listen to Professor Sharas Carnival. Madam, uh, waiting for your comments uh, regarding Dr. Dupadali and Gay's presentation. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, this is a very interesting uh, paper. And uh, what I uh, find uh, uh, really satisfying 
is that uh, you're thinking in terms of uh, looking at this whole thing through the lens of uh, negligence and not running towards uh, strict liability. Strict liability has always brought its uh, problems. It's alien to the Roman Dutch law. The exceptions to strict liability have been misunderstood. We have only really to look at Rylance and Fletcher and how it was introduced here and how the exceptions were misinterpreted into agricultural fires and all sorts of things to know that strict liability may not be the way to go. And uh, so this uh, idea that we should be revisiting uh, the duty of care concept is, I really think, the way uh, to go and to deal with this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, now, I'd like you to consider whether there are any analogies uh, that you can draw on uh, where the duty of care was revisited and amended. Because I think uh, we will have to go in for uh, analogies uh, when we are talking of revisiting uh, and developing um, the, the duty of care sort of concept. Um, you'll have to also look very carefully at the judgment of De Soisa versus uh, Arasakula Ratna to see you know, uh, what are the constraints uh, that were placed on uh, developing the Aquinian uh, action by uh, that case. But even though uh, Justice Deeraratna talked about ironing out the creases, in fact, when, it, when you look at his analysis on duty of care, it, it did take the concept further. So I think uh, sort of you could use uh, that too uh, to looking at, of course, that was medical negligence, but uh, you could take that case into account as well when you're, uh, re when you're developing and you're perhaps introducing new concepts uh, into this whole uh, formulation. But as I say, what I find uh, most convincing about the paper is this idea of developing an existing concept. Because really, that, that is the way you're going to see some sort of result fairly soon. If we are staying for, you know, um, statutory frameworks, we might be staying forever, you know. So this is the way to go, to stretch, to, you know, see how to use the elasticity within the Roman Dutch law. That is the great strength of the Roman Dutch law, that it is fairly elastic. Uh, use that to deal with this. So um, congratulations, uh, Dr. Udapadi, for uh, not being frightened to uh, deal with uh, something that is all around us and mm -hmm. for looking at the Roman Dutch law and the Aquilian action and the duty of care to respond to this. Of course, uh, we do have to, as you have pointed out, bring in some new dimensions into the duty of care. So congratulations and all the best in developing uh, this very exciting uh, paper. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you very much, Professor Shah Carnival, for your uh, very important comments and very valuable comments to our presenters. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, listen to Professor Kamina Gunaratna. Professor Gunaratna, waiting for you uh, for your comments. Yeah, can you hear me, Kaushani? Hello. Yes, madam. Yes, madam. We can hear you, madam. Can you yes. hear me? Yes, madam. Oh, okay. Sure. Right. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Napadi. I also agree with Professor Sharia uh, that you are now transmitting um, the concept of negligence into a very relevant and um, timely area. Uh, I'll just make a couple of comments. Uh, when you do this, you might also be looking again into realms of public law uh, and um, the options that in reality people may have uh, if they do want to file this kind of case. So again, you may be looking at state liability. Uh, you may be looking at uh, fundamental rights and uh, maybe this kind of issue won't arise in Sri Lanka, but 
there are rights issues that have arisen in other countries, uh, particularly where people are claiming the right, for example, not to wear a mask and not to take precautions and to and claiming that even lockdowns and restrictions on movement are violations of their fundamental rights. So these might also impact on the issue of negligence. Uh, so negligence may have to be negotiated, taking all those factors into mind. And if you are also going into the area of dealing, uh, you may also have to look at intentional harm. Um, uh, where people, you know, where if people or criminal negligence, for example, if the negligence is so great, uh, for example, I think in many countries, uh, spreading sexually transmitted diseases or even HIV AIDS, if a person is aware uh, that they are infected and then they engage in risky behavior, which puts other people at risk, I think the courts have even charged them with assault or even uh, criminal liability. Uh, so as uh, Professor Sharia said, when you're looking at analogies, and I think that is fundamentally what your paper is trying to do, uh, you may have to negotiate um, all these different issues, uh, particularly when it's person-to-person -person, um, transmission or infection. Uh, as Justice Nawaz pointed out, the employer situation may be easier. Uh, because employers do have a duty of care to have a, a safe workplace, which also includes non-transmission of uh, the virus. Uh, so that may be easier, but in other contexts, uh, you may have to look at a whole range of analogies uh, that, are, um, you know, that, uh, that will get involved in this whole situation. But as Professor Shari also said, uh, I think... Uh, you're also into a very innovative um, path here. And so good luck with it. And I would be very interested to see how you progress on this. So just a few ideas about uh, what you may need to look at. Thank you very much, Anu. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kamena Gunaratna. And uh, so we're going to move to our next session next technical session on labor law. So before moving to the next session, I'm extremely being honored and thankful all of our uh, legal luminaries and distinguished members of the panel to participate in today's first session on Delict Law uh, during their uh, very busy working schedule. And uh, actually very thankful, thanks, thankful to you, uh, dear uh, distinguished members, uh, to give in uh, very valuable comments to our presenters. And we are very highly and greatly appreciate your valuable support to the Department of Private and Comparative Law and Faculty of Law of University of Columbia. And we are eager, we are waiting for you uh, for our next uh, year's uh, symposiums as well. Dear sir, madam, madams and dear professors, everyone, thank you. And thank you very much, uh, especially uh, to the presenters and uh, 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 all the uh, members of the first session. So before we move into the next, uh, technical session, we would like to have a quick break for five minutes uh, until our panelists uh, log in to the session. So we'll have a quick break, just uh, only four to five minutes, and we'll uh, come up for the next session. Thank you very much.
Welcome to the technical session two of Department of Private and Comparative Law. Uh, technical session two consists in three labor law papers. Uh, so uh, before uh, we uh, move into the presentations, I would like to uh, introduce our very distinguished panel of the mem uh, judges uh, for the technical session two uh, on uh, labor law. Uh, I would like to very warmly welcome Honorable Justice uh, Esture Raja, sir, and uh, Ms. Shama Salgado for uh, second technical session of Department of Private and Comparative Law. So let me uh, give a brief on our uh, distinguished panelists. Honorable Justice Esture Raja, Honorable Justice of the Supreme Court of Sri Lanka, former Justice of the Court of Appeal of Sri Lanka and High Court of Fiji, and former Additional Solicitor General, President Counsel, and his Sir Honorable Justice Ture Raja, sir, he served as alumni of Faculty of Law, University of Colombo, and University of London as well. We are extremely and very warmly welcome, sir, you for our session of a technical session two of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. And our next, next uh, distinguished uh, uh, panelist, uh, Ms. Shama Salgado. Uh, Ms. Shama Salgado is the senior program officer uh, for ILO country office in Sri Lanka in 2013. And she served as the national program coordinator uh, International Labor Organization 2015 to 2016 period. And she is also served as an alumni of Faculty of Law, University of Colombo. And uh, I would like to tell her research specializations, Ms. Shama Salgado's specializations on international labor law and democratic governance and gender rights. Ms. Shama Salgado, we are really warmly welcome you to the technical session two of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. So we uh, move in. Excuse me. excuse me. May I just yes. make a small correction? I have retired now from the ILO. Oh, okay. Just <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'm more the senior program. There. Okay, okay, extremely uh, sorry for the inconvenience. And anyway, we are delightful and we are very honored to have you, uh, Ms. Shama Salgado. So we'll move into our uh, next, uh, the very first uh, presenter, presentation of the technical session two. Uh, Mr. A. Sarveshwaran. Uh, Mr. A. Sarveshwaran is the senior lecturer of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. He's a actually very senior lecturer of our, uh, especially on labor law. So we all know about uh, our Sarveshwaran sir. And uh, Mr. Sarveshwaran sir, he's a uh, specialization on labor law and environment law and constitutional law, as well as conflict and peace studies. Mr. Sarveshwaran is presenting today on COVID-19 pandemic and Emerging Labor Issues in Sri Lanka, and Assessment of Legal Responses. Over to you, sir, for your presentation. The topic is COVID-19 pandemic and emerging labor issues in Sri Lanka, and assessment of legal responses. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused many labor issues in Sri Lanka. The objectives are to identify the labor issues that have emerged due to the COVID-19 pandemic and to assess the effectiveness of the legal responses available to the labor issues and to make suggestions for law reform to respond to the labor issues, if any. I would like to give some labor issues that have emerged because of the COVID-19 pandemic. One is the change of work arrangements, reduction of wages, unilateral decisions of employers to make use of statutory leaves. That means without the concern of the workers, non-availability of paid sick leave in the labor legislation, non-availability of paid quarantine leave in the labor legislation when it comes to sick leave and the quarantine leave related to 
the conduct of COVID-19 pandemic from the workplaces, work-related disease of COVID-19, delays in statutory contributions for the reasons beyond the control of the employers, non-availability of health and safety measures with regard to biological hazards in the labor legislation, payment of compensation for occupational diseases that come under the workman's compensation ordinance does not cover the disease of COVID-19. Therefore, the employees who conduct the COVID-19 at workplaces are not entitled to compensation under the compens workman's compensation ordinance. And also, the industrial disputes that have emerged because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and also because of the economic effects of the pandemic, now the employers have gone for layoff, temporary discharge of workers, uh, retention, reducing the workers who are excess in the workplace and closure of the business. So when it comes to the research, the findings are the employers have introduced various forms of work arrangements using the digital technology, digital platforms and the satellite technology in the new normal conditions. Here the issue is when it comes to these work arrangements, whether the person who is engaged under these work arrangements are M workers or independent contractors. But it is suggested the test that the courts have developed to differentiate a workman from an independent contractor could be creatively used to identify whether the, uh, the, uh, the, the persons who provide the services under these new forms of work arrangements are workers or independent contractors. The other issue is when it comes to temporary employment contracts and the fixed-term contracts, uh, sometimes there are breaks because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So when the breaks intervene, so we can consider these are supervening impossibilities. In this situation, I don't think we can say there's a frustration, but we can uh, we can say there is a situation which could be considered, considered as held in abeyance. So when it comes to that type of situation, the employers should be discharged from payment of wages during that period, but the parties can renegotiate and go for uh, uh, new forms of contracts, uh, contractual terms. Or in other words, they can extend the period of those contracts. So the other issue is the employers make unilateral decisions to make use of the casual leave and the annual leave to the workers who are unable to report to work because of lockdown. But it is violation of the ILO convention. Uh, so it is suggested that when it comes to such situation, making use of those leaves should be in consultation with the workers. But when it comes to our labor legislation, there is no provision for unilateral decision to make use of those decisions by the employers. The other one is the salary reductions during this period. When it comes to the salary re reductions, actually, when it comes to the labor legislation, the Shop and Office Employees Act and the Wages Force Ordinance, there are provisions for salary deductions, not for re reductions. When it comes to salary deductions in the labor legislation, uh, there are uh, provisions for authorized salary deductions with the concern of the workmen. But the salary reductions are not having any legal validity. Therefore, it is suggested the legislative intent intervention is needed to provide for salary reduction when it comes to such situations. The other one is uh, when it comes to the labor legislation of Sri Lanka, there's no provision for sick leave or paid quarantine leave. It is suggested the labor legislation should be amended to provide for sick leave and quarantine leave, leave when it comes to work-related COVID-19 issues. The other one is when it comes to the female workers, mainly the pregnant mothers. The expectant mothers are more vulnerable to the disease of COVID-19. But when it comes to our labor legislation, we don't have provisions with regard to measures that the employers will have to take to protect the workers from biological hazards. So we don't have any such provision in any of our labor legislation. Therefore, it is suggested the labor legislation should be amended to prohibit the employment of pregnant mothers uh, in works that 
on works that may be that may expose them to the to biological hazards and also the workers with health complications also become more vulnerable when it comes to the covid-19 pandemic therefore the labor legislation shall be amended to prohibit the employment of workmen with uh, serious health complications uh, on any work that may expose them to biological hazards but there is a regulation gazetted under the prevention of uh, quarantine and prevention of diseases ordinance and it has provisions the regulation has provisions uh, with regard to the measures that the employers will have to take to protect the workers uh, with regard to covid-19 pandemic but the regulations have been made gazetted to prevent the spread of the disease not with the intention of protecting the workers in the at the workplaces therefore it is suggested that labor legislation should be amended to provide for uh, obligations of the employers to take necessary uh, measures to protect the workers from biological hazards the workman compensation ordinance has provisions with regard to payment of compensation for accidents and occupational diseases but the, when it comes to the ordinance it does not cover the disease of covid-19 therefore the ordinance should be amended to provide for compensation to the workers who conduct the disease at workplaces when the industrial disputes act has mechanisms uh, that uh, for settlement of industrial disputes therefore it is suggested the mechanisms under the industrial disputes act should be effectively used to settle the disputes that arise because of the covid-19 pandemic the labor issues that arise from the covid-19 pandemic the mechanism uh, that is conciliation under the uh, industrial disputes act and also collective bargaining could be more effectively used to deal with the labor issues that emerge because of the covid-19 pandemic the termination act provides for the procedure with regard to non disciplinary termination the non disciplinary termination such as layoff temporary discharge of workers retrenchment reducing the number of workers who are excess in the workplace and the closure of the business places all three come under the non disciplinary terminations now because of the economic effects of the covid-19 pandemic the, these types of non disciplinary terminations take place when it comes to the termination act it says it provides that uh, employer shall obtain the written consent of the workman or prior written approval approval of the commissioner for such non disciplinary terminations the act provides that the commissioner could make decisions with regard to the grant of approval for non disciplinary terminations here the according to the provisions of the act if the employer can't get the consent of the workers if they i would suggest it is always better to have a dialogue with the workers and the unions and to go for some settlement and get the written consent of the workman for such non disciplinary termination otherwise the employer will have to get the approval of the commissioner for the non disciplinary terminations when it comes to the commissioner section 2 subsection 2 e of the termination act provides that the commissioner could grant the approval for non disciplinary termination subject to the terms and conditions including payment of compensation when it comes to that particular section the words may absolute discretion and including indicate that the commissioner is not always bound to order payment of compensation therefore i would suggest the employer can go for different method of payment for his approval for non disciplinary termination there is no mandatory obligation on the employer sorry on the uh, commissioner to order payment of compensation always so the commi commissioner can balance the interests of the parties and make the decision and also some places the employers because of the economic effects of the covid-19 pandemic the employers transfer the workers from one company to another company without their consent such transfers without the consent of the workers become 
termination in terms of the termination of employment of workmen special provisions act at the end i would conclude saying that when it comes to the labor issues that have emerged because of the covid-19 pandemic uh, when it comes our labor uh, regime labor law regime or the legal framework for of labor law does not have adequate responses to deal with such labor issues therefore it is suggested to have legislative interventions to have effective responses to the labor issues that have emerged because of the covid-19 pandemic thank you thank you very much dear sir for a very interesting presentation so i would like to open the forum for the discussion now uh, i first uh, invite our very distinguished members of the panel uh, for uh, their comments uh, regarding mr sarveshwaran's presentation so i first uh, would like to uh, invite uh, honorable justice s today raja sir sir over to you uh regarding the comments uh, of uh, mr sarveshwaran sir's presentation yeah good afternoon can you hear me yes sir yes we can hear you properly lovely, lovely. um dr sarveshwaran its congratulations uh, you have done a wonderful job thank you sir for your time uh, i i have uh, some issues what happens is um in in a lighter vein um sarveshwaran do you think that this is going to be our new normal you know, what happens is this is a covid 19 pandemic is it going to be a one off incident or is it going to be a new incident like is it going to be for lifetime that's uh, the issue because you know, what happens is if it is one of the incident it's going to be if it is going to be over then we need not change the entire legal system or virtually the labor law uh, the line of uh, legislations but on the other side if you are going to expect because everybody thought that this will be over in a month or two yeah, at the beginning in somewhere in march april uh, this year everybody thought uh, this will be over in another few weeks or few months maximum but still we have not seen anywhere uh, so is it going to be the new normal that's my other question uh kama say that uh, thinking of um, we have the new uh, vaccines uh, on the card is it going to be over so that those are the issues which we have to see before we amend the law but anyhow if there is a problem we have to find a solution as an academic you have done a wonderful job uh, dr sarveshwaran because um, rather than keeping it quiet we have to address it okay so let me i just went through your abstracts and uh, wonderful presentations um, once again uh, it was very useful i could find about eight uh, suggestions that you have made minimum of eight there is one or two which comes under the other links also if it is eight i my my concern is we are talking about the there are two parties one is about the employer and the employee the this the labor laws are talking about that but uh, the new developments going through under this uh, covid pandemic in the entire world you could see the status involved in it the the, the government is involved in solving the issues if you take us if you take uh, Uh, the european countries especially our neighboring country india their government has stepped in to solve or take certain burden from the employers because the employers also equally affected no i'm not supporting the supporting a party so since sri lanka is a welfare state because we we are democratic welfare state uh, as you know much your expert on constitutions are reason um knowing the fact that uh, we are a welfare state why did the state responsibility that's my concern here uh, but uh, can i come back to you after my beloved friend shama's uh, contribution so i'll i'll keep it at this point 
after Kaushal, after Shyama, that I wish to add some more because she is the expert. Okay. Thank you very much, Honorable Justice uh, Sture Rajas. So thank you very much. And uh, we are moving to uh, Ms. Shama Salgado. Um, Shama Salgado, we are waiting for your valuable comments over Mrs. Sarveshwaran's presentation. Yes. I don't know. Somehow my video doesn't seem to be working, but can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sure, sure, ma'am. Sure. We now. can hear you. Yes. Okay. Uh, first, I want to say congratulations to Sarves. As per usual, he has been very uh, incisive in his analysis, uh, demonstrating very well that he is a labor law expert indeed, and that's why we come to him all the time. <laughs> uh, so congratulations on that, and it's a very relevant bit of um, yeah. research that you have done, sir. Now, we really appreciate it. It's being very practical on the issue. You have analyzed it so incisely and picked the gaps, as it were, in the labor law to address the new normal working environment in particular. So when you say, you know, you dwell on the difference between deduction and reduction of um, salaries and emoluments and wages, and I think that is very relevant and you have to define it pretty well in the new normal to ensure that the uh, asymmetry in the employer-employee relationships does not work in favor or, uh, in, uh, shall I say, put it this way, against the worker. Then paid sick leave, because it's limited and in the corona I mean, the con context, it's obviously like two weeks of quarantine and maybe to play safe another two weeks, which is not provided for in our law. So those uh, like quarantine leave, protection against biohazards, very important, especially for pregnant women. And I'm very happy with the gender dimension you have brought into your um, the proposed amendments. Workers' Compensation Act, Yes, should be providing for COVID exposure and um, uh, the impact, the negative impact on the worker. Uh, what I may dispute in this case is your proposal to delay, uh, I mean, uh, waive the penalty for delay in paying gratuity payments, which I saw in your abstract. Also, now, there, I felt that even the worker who's moving out to the workplace uh, due to circumstances or by will, uh, voluntarily, would do it with intention, obviously, of seeking uh, an alternate form of employment, maybe self-employment. And the government is also promoting self-employment, small businesses, and encouraging them in the COVID context and even before. So looking at the public policy there, Quite often, I know that the gratuity lump sum is used by these people to start up their own businesses, and it is very, very important. So, waiving that fee on delaying that payment is not very encouraging from a worker perspective, I feel. That is my sort of only, um, I wouldn't say objection, but questioning of uh, what you have uh, proposed as labor law reform. Uh, across the room, I would also like to uh, address the issue of the welfare state and the asymmetry. I think labor law uh, is something that we have to look at it from also an asymmetry in the working relations between the employer and in the employee especially in the small businesses, the medium enterprises, and also sometimes the unorganized larger sectors. So uh, uh, even if COVID is not here to stay, I would think that the concept of a sunset clause or a sunset law concept would be factored into the labor uh, law amendments that are proposed by Mr. Sarvis to fit into the new normal and perhaps give it a period of time where it will lapse unless it is reinstated. 
I think uh, that I would recommend. And of course, uh, we have to do a little bit of consultation. It's very important to do tripartite consultations before we actually propose this law, uh, Mr. Sarve's law. So I'm sure you have made reference to consultations and the consultation process, but we have to take that very seriously because it is a tripartite engagement. Uh, it's an imperative because we have three parties dealing with it, the government also as a kind of a balancing uh, and uh, responsible state party. And then we have the employers and the uh, workers who have to be consulted because they're direct stakeholders in what would happen or not happen or whether the impact would be negative or positive in their favor. And they are the authority after all because they are in it. They are part of that whole working paradigm. Yeah, so that is what I have to say at the moment. Over to you. Thank you. Judge, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ms. Shama Salgado. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, go with Honorable Justice uh, Ture Raja, sir. So do you, uh, do you told me that you have to tell something? Uh, so we are waiting for you. Yeah, it's lovely. Yes, uh, what happens is, um, um, as, uh, as uh, Shama said, it is. Uh, it has to go through the consultative process. Agreed. But uh, my concern is, are we going to have a a full change of law? Because this is uh, the entire. I think I'm. If I understand correctly, Dr. Sarvesan was uh, basing the entire thing is on the COVID-19 pandemic. So if that is so, now for an example, the last portion of the, the gratuity and the hazardous, hazardous, it's obviously it has to be more sensitive towards the, the gender balance or the, the pregnant women. Of course, that's, that's the most, most important thing. It's more human. But my concern is there are certain portions which already we are in trouble because we do see every day when it comes to the court and the other work, uh, not that I'm in, against anything. I'm not, I'm against, I'm very favorable to the amendments, the welfare of the, the employees. My, my concern is uh, when we take about the last 40 years, are we becoming more or anti-employer uh, process? Because what happens is we have to look after the employees. That's very important. Their welfare has to be looked after. In the meantime, do we have to look after the investors? That's also important because if there is no investors, if there is no employers, there is no employee. So it doesn't mean that they have to, the employer is permitted to eat into the employee. But the employer's welfare also needs to be considered because we, the last, um, I think Dr. Sarveson, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I, whether, I don't know whether you've finished your research on that subject or the subject which I was, uh, I discussed with you, because there are a lot of investments which were taken away from the country as well as which, has, which didn't come into the country. The both are worst because uh, it's the limited things which has gone into, I guess, uh, Sarveson, you know that uh, which has gone to Bangladesh and Vietnam. Some of our the major investments or from major companies have gone there because of non-conducive employment, uh, non-conducive environment in Sri Lanka. They use the word non-conducive environment. That is, in fact, they are worried about their uh, the factories have been closed. Like that's that's a uh, the concern they had. Now, for an example, if you change from one place to another place, that, of course, uh, Dr. Sarvesan handled it very well, uh, that uh, I can't go into the paper again, because saying that if you shift from one place to another place, there are 10 companies, you know, that uh, due to the uh, EU collapse, the importation of uh, garments or certain clothing items was stopped. So there are certain companies who were one of fine, fine uh, uh work on it, I might say the garment work on it, they had to close down a couple of uh, factories. So they closed down and they moved to the other factories, but they didn't retrench the workers. They didn't throw out the employees. 
But unfortunately, a factory in, uh, uh, say, Matara had to be closed and brought to, the employees were brought to uh, Gaul. But the employees were protested. And uh, they said, no, we can't. We will not move in. We can't go there. So what is the plight of the, the employer? My concern is, now, if you, that is one of the research that he had, one of the item that Dr. Sadminson has gone in, it's very good. But I'm not saying that to support one party, that to see both parties to be looked after properly. Otherwise, we are in to be in trouble. Anyhow, it's a good paper. Very nice, uh, very nice uh, views are expressed. Um, it, should be be done. it should be done with consultation. Yes, sure. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Justice Sister Thank Ray Raja, you. sir. Thank you very much. And I hope, uh, uh, Mr. Sarveshwaran's, uh, you got very valuable comments and very interesting comments. I hope uh, it's very important for you. Mr. Sarveshwaran, you, do you have anything to tell? Uh, uh, thank you, His Lordship. Uh, actually, I fully agree with His Lordship that, uh, you know, when it comes to labor law, we have to balance the interest of the employers, the workers, and the state. It is very, very important. I, thought, I fully agree with your comment. And also, when it comes to the suggestions also, I agree with you, uh, His Lordship, that okay. we have to identify the issues. And when it comes to the legislative interventions, we have to go for the interventions that could be permanent one. The other one may be temporary because of the uh, situation that we have. And also, when it comes to Madam Shyama, uh, I, I understand your concern. But at the same time, there may be employers who may be uh, unable to make their contribution within the 30 days from the date of termination for the reasons beyond their control. So th th it is to uh, consider their interest also, the employer's interest also, the suggestion has been made, because we have provisions in the EPF Act, EPF Act, but not in the uh, Gratuity Act. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sarveshwaran. Thank you very much. And uh, 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 if you are, uh, yeah, we are moving to the uh, discussion with the participants. Uh, so, the dear participants, if you have any question, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, there's a symbol uh, in the screen, then you may click it and uh, you may uh, ask any question from Mr. Sarveshwar regarding his presentation. We are waiting. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sarveshwaran, sir. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. So we are uh, moving to the next presentation. Uh, next presentation uh, uh, is uh, from Ms. Yashoda Ekanayaka. She is the lecturer of Department of Private and Comparative Law. Her research interests are in labor law uh, and family law and child rights. And uh, her topic today is Child labor, child labor in Sri Lanka, comparison of domestic legal standards with international standards. Uh, Ms. Yashoda, over to you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My presentation topic is Child Labor in Sri Lanka, Comparison of Domestic Legal Standards with International Standards. This is the outline of my presentation. The main objective of this study is to evaluate the adequacy of existing legal measures to eliminate child labor. Furthermore, law reforms will be proposed for the existing legislation to create more effective rules to eradicate child labor and ensure the protection of child rights. This paper mainly focuses on international and national legal standards relating to child labor and discusses about the international conventions, international labor organization conventions, which are relevant to both the controlling and the elimination of child labor and to the, and to, uh, the ensuring of child rights. Uh, this paper will further discuss the national legal responses in the context of international instruments. Moreover, the paper will discuss how to further extend the domestic legal safeguards available for eliminating child labor and will also examine the sufficiency of the strength of the domestic legal framework in order to achieve the goals stated above. Subsequently, it is expected to discuss the shortcomings and lacunas in Sri Lankan law which have been identified. 
This is a comprehensive qualitative research of domestic legislation and policies will be conducted in comparison with international conventions and standards. When it comes to discussion, I would like to first discuss about international standards. Sri Lanka has signed many ILO conventions, including eight co conventions. The following conventions are related to the subject of child labor. You can see them. However, Sri Lanka has not ratified the Domestic Workers Convention, which provides high protection for child domestic workers as well as for adult domestic workers. The International Labour Organization was established in 1999 and enacted many conventions for balancing the interests between the state, the employers and the employee. When the ILO formulates conventions and policies, it is not sufficient to merely consider the interest of the labourers. The ILO should be mindful of the requirements of both the state and of the employers too. Moreover, there are many United Nations conventions which have included provisions in relation to ensure the protection of child rights and the elimination of child labor. The main instrument in this regard is the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and its optional protocol on children in armed conflict and child trafficking and pornography. Other instruments are the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, International Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and etc. The provisions which are included in these conventions will be discussed in the course of this paper. The International Program on Elimination of Child Labor was established under the International Labor Organization. Through this program, it was expected to fulfill the objective of eliminating the existence of child labor by strengthening the ability of relevant countries to deal with all the problems which consequently arise via the legal framework. Now I would like to discuss about national standards. In Sri Lanka, there are much legislation for controlling and eliminating child labor, namely Employment of Women, Children and Young Persons Act, Shop and Office Employees Act, Mines and Minerals Act, Factory Ordinance, and Penal Code of Sri Lanka. These acts will be discussed fully in this paper. The Directive Principles of Article 27, 27 Subsection 13 of the Sri Lankan Constitution states that the government shall provide special care to promote the interest of children and youth so as to ensure their full development in terms of their physical, mental and moral, religious and social well-being and to protect them from exploitation and discrimination. Sri Lanka also has an institutional framework in place for investigating, monitoring and eliminating child labor issues. The relevant institutions are the Department of Labor, the Women's and Children's Bureau under the Police Department of Sri Lanka and the Department of Probation and Child Care. In the Sri Lankan Labor Department, there is a se separate division called Women's and Children's Affairs Division, which undertakes the investigation of child labor issues. The Labor Department has the responsibility of monitoring the application of international ratifications of conventions and standards. However, without having proper mechanisms based on the available resources, the commissioner and officers cannot be achieved the effectiveness required of them by the use of nearly the power wasted in them. In Sri Lanka, there is a labor office in each district headed by the assistant labor commissioners. These commissioners are able to file cases against violation of the provisions of employment of women, young persons, and children's act. Moreover, labor department has power to implement administrative powers with regard to violation under the factory soldiers. The Department of Probation and Child Care is established under the Children's and Young Persons Ordinance. This institution also deals with matters pertaining to child labor. The other main institution is uh, the Children's and Women's Bureau under the supervision of Sri Lanka Police Department. Sri Lanka nearly, sorry, two thirds of the police stations have established uh, children and women's deaths within their premises. This bureau has office, uh, offices to investigate relevant matters. They are specially trained for this purpose. Other than the above mentioned institution, the National Child Prote Protection Authority was established under the National Child Protection Authority Act. This authority conducted several programs for raising awareness among the general public for consulting and coordinating with other government officers for recommending legal reforms where necessary and for monitoring such implementations. This institute plays a major role in preventing the use of child labor in Sri Lanka. 
previously in sri lanka violations on both the employment of women young persons and children act and the factory ordinances were directed to the magistrate courts however after the 1998 amendment to the criminal procedure act all cases of child abuses are heard under sorry heard the jurisdiction of the high court of sri lanka additionally judicial medical officers are involved in this process because their opinion are taken into consideration that the real age of the child is in question moreover these jms provide evidence for child abuse in the context of child labor furthermore the children and young persons ordinance have established jury courts for the purpose of hearing any charge against children or young persons and uh, provisions for it. included relating to jurisdictions of jury courts their establishment and the procedure which should be followed by them uh, now i would like to discuss about applicability of international and national standards deciding the minimum age for child labor is a very serious issue because it should strike a balance between the child rights state and development and the child's economic rights the united nations convention on the rights of the child the main international conventions relating to child rights and its article 32 subsection 2a provides that the state should impose minimum age requirements for employment according to these provisions every state party to this convention has a responsibility to protect and promote safeguards for the child's best interest moreover article 103 of the international convention on economic social and cultural rights states that children and young persons should be protected from economic and social exploitation and that child labor should be prohibited and punishable by law furthermore there are a number of ilo conventions related to minimum age for different sectors different sectors most of the ilo conventions set 15 years as minimum age for admissions to employment the current ilo convention in position is convention 138 of 1973 on the minimum age for employment this has superseded all the above mentioned conventions this 138 convention states that 15 years is the minimum age for all types of employment but countries which do not have sufficient economic and educational facilities can decide to lower the minimum age as to 14 years of age therefore it can be argued that the countries have a discretion to set the minimum age for work according to their standards Article 31 of the convention states that the minimum age for admission to any type of employment which jeopardize the health, safety and morale of young persons shall not be less than 18 years of age. Under the Employment Women, Young Persons and Children Act, according to the earlier regulation, minimum age requirement was 12 years and later it was amended by regulation in 2000 to be 14 years of age. therefore it can be argued that children who are between 14 to 18 years are entitled to work with few restrictions but that employing children who are under 14 years of age is considered as an offence however under the regulation of 2010 on hazardous employment some categories of work that are mentioned below are totally prohibited under 18 years of age The Factory Ordinance and the Shop and Office Employees Act introduced the minimum wage requirements as 14 years for work. Moreover, the Minimum Wages Indian Ordinance increased the minimum wage requirement from 10 years to 14 years under the amendment. Under the Mines and Minerals Act, minimum wage is 16 years for boys for working in mines, while it is totally prohibited for girls to engage in employment related to these fields. when considering the child's right to engage in economic activities there should be a healthy balance right between the right to education and economic rights for achieving the concept of the best interest of the child uh, i would like to pay your attention that there are four bills introduced in very recently for increase minimum age for work up to four up to 16 years Uh, since i am uh, exceeding the given time i am not going to talk about worse forms of child labor hazardous forms of work and on working conditions actually i have prepared 39 slides i can uh, share them with you all later now i would like to uh, conclude my presentation This paper mainly discusses both the international and national labor standards regarding child labor. 
This research essay selected important areas relevant to the above and the impact on the child's well-being for discussion. Under the selected subheadings, both the international legal framework and the existing Sri Lankan legislation in this regard were analyzed. According to the above discussion, it is realized that there are plenty of provisions available at both the international and the domestic level for controlling and eliminating child labor. Nevertheless, there are sufficient laws dealing with these issues discussed. Economic, social, and cultural barriers affect their efficient applicability. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Yashoda, uh, for a very interesting uh, presentation on child labor in Sri Lanka. And uh, so I would like to uh, go for the discussion forum now. So I would like to first to listen to our Honorable Justice uh, Esture Raja, sir. So uh, you're over to you for the comments regarding Ms. Yashoda's uh, paper. Yeah, once again, <coughs> Uh, I might say, uh, I don't want to say congratulations to uh, Ms. Uh, Ekanayaka. The reason is, I have to say all the best. Because you are jumped into a deep ocean. And I don't know whether you can swim across, because this is one of the most um, researched area in the world. Still, even there are a million people researched, still they can do research on this. Uh, all the very best for your PhD. You can do your double PhD on the same subject. Anyhow, you did you did very just and a, a reasonable contribution towards this topic. Miss um, Ekanak, I have a small issue. What happens is, are we going to say the legal standard of the Sri Lanka and the international? Because when it says international, there are several zones and the regions involved now. Because child labor, we are trying to have a uniform system. That is what the U UN and uh, ILO says. But unfortunately, <clears throat> that is not an international one because you would have find it difficult with the, with the age because one says 18 because we are trying to have it 18. In fact, we are trying to have it 18 from the beginning. <clears throat> but for certain purpose, it was brought down even up to 12 because <coughs> Sorry, uh, I think we are passing the lunch time. <coughs> so the problem is the employers at the beginning in the 18th, 19th century, they really want to get the maximum out of our people. They even allow the children as low as eight years to work, depriving their school education. I mean, if you see the historical one, it goes on. Then it came up at one point. And uh, when it comes to Sri Lanka, it took an absolute 90 degree turn. And they turned back and said, no, nothing doing. It's 18 years. Because that was the policy. The laws had been amended here and there uh, on and off. The policy, because we don't want to ruin the child's education. Because the child's compulsory education, because these are two ages. When it comes to the child, in child laborers, they which is opposed to on one side is the education, the other side is the employment. If he goes to school, he can't work. If he goes to work, he can't go to school. So that was a serious issue we had. So when it discussed, I think uh, the other people, Dr. Sarveswaran, uh, Ms. Shama and all will know, because what happens is uh, when it was discussed, the, the Middle East countries, uh, the African countries did not agree for the age, the, the minimum age which even came down to 12 years. They didn't agree. And at one place, then it was allowed to be subjectively accepted. What I'm trying to say is, may I suggest, uh, Ms. Uh, Yasuda, uh, would you like to change your topic to, uh, I, I'm, I'm subject, I'm just on a concern I'm saying. Sri Lanka comparing with the UN and ILO or UN EU or UN ASEAN, UN South Africa, sorry, uh, South Asia, so, something to a zone. Because what happens is we are different from the others. If you want to do it internationally, it's, as I said, that you can do 10 PhDs. It's too wide. Because are you going to compare the 
Latino countries, because now they have a new concept. The Brazil concept is a completely a new concept, which was brought about two years ago. And uh, they are on a completely new concept and a new one, because it's originally they went for the Cuban one. But the Cuban one, because of certain American issues, they, that was dropped down. Now the Brazil. Brazil was virtually taking up the Cuban concept. <laughs> what is the Cuban concept? Best for all. Simple theory. Best for all. That's what they thought. And they don't want the children to work. And they want to give education to all. And they want to give best health, uh, etc., etc. So therefore, if you are going to use the word international, I really warmly welcome you, but it's too, too, too vast. You will not do justice to the topic. So if you can narrow it down to a zone, or you can say international with the reference, with the concern I'm saying it. Yeah, so the, the problem is not that I, I have anything against this word international. International is too wide. So somebody can find fault with you at the different place to say, uh, say that, look, you have not covered the... Eastern Africa, because <laughs> even in Africa, to take East and West, South, there are two different concepts, or virtually yes. there are several different concepts. And little if you go about, the, the Middle East countries are completely different concepts. <laughs> Let us come back to our uh, SARC. Now, that is a different concept. We are trying to develop something new, which we have been told, but we are trying to develop new. So India is going about on that concept and they are taking the leading role and we should and give a good run to them. Okay. Coming back to the subject, I wish uh, there are uh, the problems are identified. Uh, list of problems maybe it may go to hundreds and thousands and narrow it down to few but you can take it to your hands. Right? And these are the problems. Now, the, all these are problems, and these are the problems I'm addressing. Now, for an example, if you take children who are working less than 16 years, a male and a female, right? Because a boy and a girl comes to the two different sectors. Because to the government sector, they don't want to employ a boy, they wish to employ a girl. Because of the nature of that work. Now, there are certain garments which... I don't want to use the word, uh, the, the, the specific garments, quote and unquote, which is which is too sensitive and they don't want the employer or the buyer, not the employer, the buyer doesn't want the male to handle those garments. It has to be a female to handle it. Then only they can sell those garments to a certain sector of the people. You know what I mean? I hope you will understand what I'm trying to say. So therefore, are we going to have equal thing or a different one? So, again, back to the, uh, the child labor. Why I said it's 16 years. Uh, as far as the employment is concerned, 16 is major at one point. But if you take the child rights, anybody who is less than 18 years is a child. So, we have a bit of a confusion and a contradiction, but it's okay. I think you have, you have jumped into the ocean. Uh, it's, I really uh, admire your guts. I, I appreciate your guts because this is a subject everybody likes it, but nobody wants to jump into it. Uh, you also tried a little. That's what I say. That the, the depth of it is too too deep. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I wish that you reconsider your uh, the, the headlines, the, the topic heading. If you can narrow it down, it'll be easier. Otherwise, you will you can't uh, because as you know that you couldn't even. Uh, put together within the stipulated time. Even yeah. you so you have to, so that is one. Second thing is, uh, I wish that if you can consider the modern technology, the era of development, technical development, technology and the technical development, and the advancement of the children's knowledge and the family situation and the welfare. There are several areas together when you're considering this child labor now, because we have a literacy rate of about 95%. That also we have to consider. Because when you're comparing the other countries, we are much, much above. So you have to put together all those things, but I am, I am very clear. 
I am 100% with you that children should not be exploited. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Justice Esture Raja. So thank you very much for your very valuable comments over Ms. Uh, Ekanayaka's presentation. Mm -hmm. And I will go to the go to Ms. Shama Salgado, Madam. Over to you for your comments regarding uh, Ms. Ekanayaka's presentation. Right. Thank you. First, I would say congratulations to the researcher. She has done a really thorough job on the legal framework, on the domestic legal framework uh, to align uh, where Sri Lanka has tried its best to align to the international conventions of the ILO 138 and 182 in particular that they have ratified. Now, I'm taking a slightly different approach because I subscribe to zero tolerance on child labor. So my approach and my comments are coming from a very practical but uh, impassioned approach on zero tolerance for child labor. But I want it to be action-oriented research and so that it can inform policy if policy needs to be adjusted or adapted. It is also a very timely study in relation to the fact that, of course, though she has not commented on it, uh, I think it becomes very, very relevant in the context of uh, post-COVID responses and the situation. Now, we know that Sri Lanka is close to making its commitment hopefully on what we did in 2010 in terms of uh, developing a roadmap and subscribing to a roadmap to eliminate the worst forms of child labor. Now, having said, it's 10 years down the road. It is time we revisited. And if you want to narrow down this study, as uh, Justice Surayraja said, I think one approach would be to look at the hazardous forms of child labor, especially under Article 3D of ILO Convention 182. Now, there, it is for countries to determine what hazardous forms of child labor should be. We did it, I remember, in 2010, perhaps, and came up with a list of 51 hazardous forms of child labor, but domestic work was not included in it. That has been a moot issue. Now, in the light of the new Domestic Work Convention, I think it would be a good way to justify what we are trying to do under hazardous forms of childhood. But it is very salutary, and I say this also to Justice Ture Raja, we already have legislation in place, and I think we raised the, mini the upper limit to a compulsory education some, a couple of years ago to 16. I believe there was a Gazette notification and it is being implemented, hopefully. There should be some monitoring by the education department, as well as uh, I think it's good that the Department of Labor does it, because they should be working hand in hand. So I am hoping that that uh, has been done, because more recently, in June, on World Day Against Child Labor, I know there was a launch of this uh, uh, initiative or commitment to raise the minimum age of employment to 16 years. And in September this year, uh, the Honorable Minister of Plantations did also announce that it had gone through cabinet approval or was presented to the cabinet. So we are now moving, forgetting about, okay, we made a commitment under 138 and the minimum age was 15. We brought it down to 14 pleading social economic conditions. As recent as September, which is in a COVID context, we still talked about raising the minimum age of employment to 16 years. So why claw back on all those gains in terms of policy? Let's move forward. But let's move forward practically. To do so practically, I believe that your research should now start focusing on and revisiting the list of hazardous forms of child labor and work with 
the Department of Labor or to inform the Department of Labor better in their process of perhaps determining something more up to date than it was 10 years ago in terms of a 51 list, uh, list of 51 hazardous forms of child labor. And remember, these are determined. They are not uh, as um, defined in Article 3, uh, Sections A, B, and C of ILO Convention 182, right? This is separate. It is to be determined nationally because ILO conventions not only look at international standards of uh, Honorable Justice Surya Raja, we are also looking, ILO always gives provision to contextualize standards, taking into consideration social economic issues within a country. And uh, that's a very salutary thing. And that is why I'm looking to uh, ILO Convention 182, Article 3, Subsection D for the researcher to go back to and revisit. I would also like to say that in her research, something that would help her is to review the Labor Inspection Systems Application, fondly known as LISA, which can also be brought into play to find out and get more statistics. Because I do believe that uh, in about 2017, 2018, there was an attempt to incorporate child labor statistics into the labor inspection systems application. So those are the emerging, um, we say sources of information and emerging areas of interest that the researcher can look at. Now she has done this very thorough study of the existing law, but I think as Honorable Tuirata said, she can move on to uh, may, maybe a more focused area. And uh, I would recommend that she moves on in that direction because it would be a useful study, very contextual, very contemporary, very relevant to the times and timely also in the best interests of the children who might also be impacted adversely post COVID because we have good educational uh, um, statistics. And I would like to again take up my friend on this, uh, Honorable Tuviraja. You said we have a fantastic uh, literacy rate, and I salute our country attempts for having reached that. But when you look at functional literacy and transition from school to the world of work, I'm not sure we can boast a 98% or 89% that you quoted, because I think functional literacy also means having certain core skills, ability to analyze and then be literate on that. And I am not sure we are quite there in those numbers that we would like to think we are at. So it's another thing to revisit. And as you know, education and child labor have a, they intersect, there is a linkage. And I suggest that you bring that paradigm uh, into the paradigm of your study as well. So I think those are the yeah, comments I had for the moment. And just to get to slide two, I think there's a slight error on slide two, if I remember right. You've said C138, something else. But C138 is in, uh, in relation to the minimum age of um, employment. ILO Convention C138 is on the minimum age of uh, employment, and maybe you should correct it. Pardon me if I misread it, in which case I'm wrong and don't correct it. Okay. Thank, Thank, you, you. Much. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Honorable Justice, Today, Rajas, yeah, and yeah. Uh, dear Madam. Thank you so much. I will incorporate everything. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shama Salgado. Thank you very much, ma'am. And uh, uh, we are moving to the uh, participants' uh, okay. questions. If we are, if any yeah, participant yes, have right. a question regarding Ms. Uh, Ekanayaka's presentation, would uh, raise your hand, uh, click your uh, raise icon, uh, raise hand icon on the screen, and uh, uh, you may okay. make your questions. So okay. we are waiting. All right. 
then uh, we're going to move to the next uh, presenter, uh, Miss Naduni Vanega Singh. Miss Naduni Vanega Singh. She's the probationary lecturer of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. So her uh, research interests uh, in human rights at work, contractual dimension of the employment relationship, and anti-discrimination law. She's speaking today on the topic of to the break of dawn, an exploration of the legal and policy interventions to reduce psychological hazards at workplaces in Sri Lanka. Ms. Naduni Vanika Singha, over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Uh, good morning. So today my research is focused on exploring the effectiveness of the Sri Lankan legislative and uh, policy interventions in reducing the risks uh, faced by private sector workers through heavy workloads and unhealthy work schedules as a growing uh, psychological hazard at workplaces. So I would be first focusing on the uh, on uh, discussing the importance of the management of psychological hazards, and then we'll be uh, uh, we'll be uh, analyzing the effectiveness of primary, secondary, tertiary interventions in uh, managing heavy workloads and unhealthy work schedules as a, a psychological hazard and workplaces. Now, why should these psychological hazards uh, be uh, managed? Why is this a problem? Now, psychological hazards have different physical, social, psychological outcomes. They have various negative physical, social, psychological as outcomes. So considering these different uh, negative impacts of psychological hazards, uh, researchers, policymakers, stakeholders in developed economies are uh, paying, uh, paying their attention on managing psychological hazards. However, still little attention uh, is paid on this regard in uh, developing countries, including Sri Lanka. So understanding this uh, intellectual, intellectual hiatus, my research, uh, I thought of uh, exploring on uh, managing, uh, cycle, uh, managing uh, heavy workloads and unhealthy work schedules as a psychological hazard in workplaces. Now, what are the primary interventions uh, in uh, managing these, uh, managing heavy workloads and unhealthy work schedules? Now, uh, primary interventions are the preventive interventions. Now, when considering the preventive interventions in uh, in, in uh, managing workload and uh, unhealthy work schedules, the flexibility of working time arrangements needs to be analyzed. Now, when considering the working time arrangements uh, of, uh, of private sector workers, still uh, the strict, the conventional strict protectionist approach can be seen in Sri Lanka. So uh, basically the eight hour conventional, uh, eight hour working model, model is followed by uh, the labor legislations applied to the private, applied to the private sector workers. So the contextual application, contextual interpretation of these different uh, labor legislations suggests suggest that these labor legislations have narrowed down their scope uh, coverage to the uh, on-site workers and on-site working and they have uh, ignored geographical functional uh, flexibility and a typical working arrangement now same uh, protectionist uh, approach can be seen in overtime and nighttime working regulations of Sri Lanka. Now, uh, especially this would apply to the female workers. Now, uh, with these uh, restrictions stimulated by gendered norms and gendered cultural assumptions, uh, the, the workers, especially the female workers, are uh, restricted in selecting uh, their preferred flexible working arrangements. Uh, 
However, this won't be applied to the informal economy. So that is the substantial inequality between formal economy and informal economy in Sri Lanka. Now, employer-oriented flexible working arrangements can be seen in the informal economic sector, but they are non-regulated. So there's a possibility of exploiting workers in these flexible working arrangements. And also, there's uh, there's no uh, there there's uh, no uh, substantial family friendly employment policies uh, strategies in uh, Sri Lanka applying to the uh, to the uh, private sector workers. And uh, and also uh, the overconnectivity of workers. Now the right to uh, disconnect from workplaces is left unaddressed um, in the uh, by uh, through the labor legislations and policy interventions in Sri Lanka. So these are the main issues that I have identified in the working time arrangements um, as a preventive intervention in uh, managing workload and unhealthy work schedules in Sri Lanka. Now, when it comes to the investigation and notification of uh, industrial diseases, the uh, factories ordinance of Sri Lanka provides uh, guidelines on that regard. Now, still again, these uh, guidelines, these provisions are focused on physical injuries rather than psychological injuries and hazards. So, uh, so this so therefore, uh, there's a necessity of moving towards a multidisciplinary approach in addressing these psychological, in, uh, in uh, managing these psychological hazards. So the proposed Occupational Health and Safety Welfare Act, if implemented, if enacted, would be a very progressive step in uh, preventing these uh, the risks that can be caused due to heavy workloads and unhealthy work schedules in the Sri Lankan legal context. Uh, so uh, now considering the secondary interventions, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health um, uh, is promoting uh, the physical, mental, social well-being of the workers, and they have uh, this organized. This institute has programs um, targeted on uh, targeted uh, for employers and employees of large-scale industries, and uh, there are two-day level one stress management programs, training programs for such. Uh, industries for such employers and employees of large scale industries. Again, they are only uh, still focusing on large scale industries and uh, small and medium scale industries uh, are given a little attention. So that needs to be, these programs needs to be extended for those, uh, for those categories too. Now, when it comes to the third year interventions, the compensation me mechanism needs to be uh, needs to be analyzed. Now, workmen's compensation ordinance is the main, uh, is the key legislation on, com uh, on uh, providing compensation for the workers um, uh, uh, caused due to injuries and accidents and workplaces. Now, how can a worker uh, injured due to a psychological hazard or a risk uh, get a compensation uh, through the workers' compensation ordinance. Now, the compensation ordinance uh, is mainly uh, focused on physical injuries and physical hazards. So there's a problem. There's there's a problem of uh, drawing a connection between uh, working schedules and unhealthy working schedules and heavy workloads with injuries caused at workplaces and this uh, and also now most of the times the injuries caused due to psychological hazards 
would not have any would uh, would would not uh, would not have any physical symptoms they would be psychological injuries uh, without any physical in, uh, symptoms so therefore there's a problem of uh, getting compensation for such injuries uh, for such uh, psychological injuries without physical symptoms and therefore there's there there's a problem of connecting uh, or problem of compensating unconventional modern types of workers through the compensation mechanism laid down in the compensation ordinance so therefore uh, creative interpretation is essential in uh, expanding the scope of worker workers compensation ordinance to cover uh, psychological hazards and the injuries caused due to psychological hazards so concluding um, in conclusion um, um uh, it is important to modify these excessive protectionist labor legislations on working time and working schedules in sri lanka um uh, and uh, the uh, psychological hazards needs to be uh, acknowledged needs to be managed through policy and legislative interventions in the sri lankan legal context thank you Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Naduni Wanigasingha. It's a very interesting presentation on uh, the psychological hazards as workplaces in Sri Lanka. So I would like to uh, turn on uh, our Honorable Justice, uh, Sture Raja, sir, sir, for your valuable comments and suggestions for our Ms. Naduni's uh, presentation. I think it's a very, very appropriate topic at an inappropriate time because it's two o'clock, hungry, feeling hungry. <laughs> Okay, take it in a lighter way. Uh, congratulations, uh, Ms. Nadhuni Vaniga Singha. I know that you are very actively involved in organizing this. Uh, apart from your uh, writing the paper, because I know how many times that you have called me and contacted me. Any of good, great work. Um, saying that um, it is, uh, as I told you, it's a very, very appropriate topic because nobody wants to talk about it because it's too sensitive. The Why is it too sensitive? Is where is the measurement? That is the other problem. If the law needs certain certainty, if you want to pass a law, law needs certain certainty, because when it comes to the psychological assessment, because we had the same issue with the children's um, the child rights, the child psychological uh, injuries, we had certain issues. So how do we assess it? Now, for an example, nobody wants to go to a psychiatric because, in a simple form, they will say they will interpret in a completely different way. If you are not feeling well, uh, I mean, if you are getting headache, you go to you just take a paracetamol or something. If you don't feel, if you are, if you don't feel well, I mean, psychologically, either you talk to somebody or you just go to a a, a counselor who can talk to you. But unfortunately, it is not much developed in Sri Lanka. The reason is these people are branded in a different way. So at the moment you say that I am not psychology, I am not, I am not uh, mentally feeling well, means that they label you as a you are mentally ill. That is the issue because if in that if on a depression, because the word uh, when you say psychological hazards, the main thing comes out in the in the thing is depression in the workload because. You, they, the, especially the female workers. I'm not uh, this one because they are rather than the male. With all due respect, rather than the male, the female workers in Sri Lankan context has huge multitasking work. Saying that they have to work at home, they have to look after the children, they have to work in the office. Sometimes they may have to work, do the others' work. So when they want to do it, they really bottled up all their problems into them. When they are bottled up. Of course, it has to explode at some place. Then the outcome, that is the work outcome, doesn't come in a better way. That I feel it's a psychological hazard because I I, I couldn't go through your full paper because I didn't get it, uh, Miss Maniga Singh. The abstracts uh, didn't do justice to your paper, I guess. 
because uh, your paper would have been much better i guess because the way that you presented the paper was uh, paper was very well uh, done so getting back to the subject is how do we assess the the injury because you call it as the injury how do we assess the injury number 2 uh, if we don't assess the injury how do we um, how do we pass the law because in the i'm just coming back to the the child rights because um, in one place it's called mental derangement the word used in the uh, law is mental derangement uh, as a prosecutor i was a prosecutor for a shorter period of about 25 30 years and <laughs> still i couldn't find it uh, an appropriate case to bring it under the mental derangement because the word singular use it manasika vyakulata abaya so who is going to assess this manasika vyakulata abaya or the mental derangement because that of course they will turn the law when it comes to the court the court want a psychiatric forensic psychiatric uh, consultant if it is a forensic psychiatric consultant obviously there are very very few in sri lanka so can we refer it i'm not deviating the subject uh, ms vanika singh that i know Uh, that you are in a, you must be wondering you now why i'm thinking of the criminal law i'm talking about the civil law but the problem is the law needs a certainty okay fine would you like to consider so therefore there is some issues there are some problems when you are going to reach passing a law so may i suggest just to consider another two things one is how about a work ethical code because in the most of the places in eu which we have found there is a code of ethics or code of conduct they place it in a different term on terminology but um, it's it, there is something if that is violated for an example if a female or a male worker is harassed by the other gender then they immediately have what is called complaining officer in the office itself once it not done so when it complain then they go through it and they try to solve within the area for an example after having a heavy fight obviously you can't sit in front of each other and work in the office so what they do is they will try to consider you to place it in a different desk at least some 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 sort then similarly they have certain other working method to get their uh, work going on to the end of the day the employer has to get the best out of these employees because they invested the money and the employees should have a reasonable work atmosphere because they are virtually spending half or virtually more than half the life in that office because if you take a work they just work more than half the balance uh, quarter they spend on the road the balance quarter they sleep at home so if you take it is almost more than half they are for the work so they should they can reasonably expect a decent working atmosphere the decent comes non harassment also or non uh, hazardous work atmosphere so i might suggest either the code of conduct and code of ethics or code of conduct or code of ethics or maybe both placed in a place and if it is not done so then there is a set up there so they have the internal investigations and everything everything but some of the companies in sri lanka has that 100% so um, once it not done then they refer the matter to the external arbitrator if it is not done then it is referred to the the other authorities like the police labor tribunal uh, labor officers etc etc so that is on one side so then you have some sort of certainty because every small tiny thing that you don't go to the police you don't go to the labor department you don't go to the labor tribunal you don't go to the labor commissioner all sort of things that is one side of it and the other side of it is can we have a clear definition for this psychological hazard very tough task you have really endeavored into a a, a greater area which very few people is uh, they are to get in i may put it up they are to get in you are being a young uh, probation officer probation lecturer and you have uh, 
uh, endeavored into a, a huge uh, risky task. Um, taking it in the other way, Ms. Vanika Singh, it was uh, nicely done. And I wish that you consider some of these suggestions and all the very best. Congratulations to start with. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Justice Suray Raja. So thank you very much for your valuable comments. So I'm waiting uh, for you, Mr. Shama Salgado. Madam, over to you for uh, to yes. comment, Ms. Naduni Vanikit Singh. Yes. I was really very excited when I saw this uh, uh, bit of work. Congratulations. And I think... Uh, Kudos to you for daring even to go that in that direction because lots of us have wanted to go in that direction but uh, got a bit diffident as you know as uh, justice himself said how do you define psychological hazards and uh, you know those are intangible the mental scars are very difficult to quantify almost identify and um, everyone keeps uh, you know negative thoughts about someone who might still have psychological um, scars uh, in a workplace. It um, can impact on your career progression, on your personal relationships, on your professional profile, all of that. And uh, we are trying, therefore, as you are trying to do this research to actually bring that hazard, a work hazard, into the paradigm of occupational safety and health and, uh, you know, compensation and that whole package of protection of the worker. And I really appreciate it because it also veers to protection of the weaker person or we'll say the disempowered woman or the disempowered person who's working with a majority of men and women as perhaps an LGBT person. And I think there's a lot of harassment in that direction also. So I think it's a very inclusive bit of legislation that you're talking about in the end. And your research on that is, I would say, an excellent start to something that we are all aspiring to ensure, this inclusivity in the world of work. It lends very well to this and work. I would like to also say that you have, uh, you know, had a threefold approach, the primary care or preventative approach, and then, okay, uh, maybe uh, the preventative approach is almost a zero tolerance approach. Then you come to the uh, secondary approach, which is, okay, once it has started, how to preempt it even at that point of time and the tertiary approach is perhaps more like after the fact. But for me, I think the primary approach is very, very important. And what you have said in that speaks well to the cliche that prevention is better than cure. Definitely. And uh, I would say push that agenda, go more into research, have an engagement with, again, the uh, at least the social partners in dialogue refers to as social partners, the employers and the workers, get more engaged with them, have a consultative process to enrich your research, come up with some uh, figures, also not only facts, to uh, strengthen this piece of work that you have done and launched on so very well. And uh, the other issue I want to flag for you is you separate context and content. But do you know that if there is somebody who's been very offensive in a workplace, they can fix the content of the work and change the context of your work in such a way that it will be a covered harassment. And you have to look at those things in your paper and address them with the, perhaps examples and experiences and lessons learned on the ground to speak to the powers so that it becomes a policy paper almost. Action-oriented research for policy change in the labor sector. And it's very salutary because we have, for, and this includes sexual harassment in the workplace. So what you're doing is really super because we have under section 345 of the penal code, sexual harassment address, and it's considered an offense. 
However, it's not really in our labor law. And this would be a superb entry point to get uh, psychological hazards, including sexual harassment in the workplace, as part of the labor law paradigm. And um, that is what I want to tell you. Uh, you have to uh, maybe go a little deeper into the problem, uh, come up with evidence so that it is evidence-based research for policy intervention. Thank you very much for that. It was very interesting reading too. And I was very excited to read this because I, mean, I felt that it was well aligned to the work that most of us women are trying to do, especially to get the workplace into an even playing field. And um, thank you. Thank you again. I really enjoyed reading it. And congratulations. Thank you very much, thank you very much uh, Ms. Shama Saga. Thank you very much, Madam. It's really, really appreciate your comments for Ms. Naduni Wanika Singh. Uh, I would like to, uh, uh, I need, we need to move to the next session, but before we move to the next session, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank to our honorable distinguished members of the session two. So I'm being honored and thankful to our legal luminaries, Honorable Justice S. Ture Raja and uh, Ms. Shama Salgadu to participate in our sessions today as distinguished panel members during their very busy working schedule and uh, during their official commitments. So we, are, we really uh, respect and uh, greatly appreciate both of your thoughts and your contributions given to our presenters in order to develop their research work in future. Thank you very much again, Honorable Justice Esture Raja, Sir, and Ms. Shama Salgadu, ma'am. And we, as the Department of Private and Comparative Law, highly expecting your valuable support in future programs as well of Faculty of Law. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, now uh, we're going to move to our next session, Technical Session 3 of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. We have uh, five presentations, five uh, research papers uh, to present today. Uh, technical Session 3 named as Property Law and Gender Rights. Uh, before going to the presentations, uh, I will take time to uh, have a brief introduction uh, to our distinguished members of the panel today. Uh, we are very warmly welcome Dr. Rose Vijay Sekara and uh, Dr. Yashodara Kadiragama Thambi for our technical session three of Department of Private and Comparative law. Let me introduce each panelist uh, today. Dr. Rose Vijay Sekara, actually, she is our former head of the Department of Private and Comparative Law, and she is currently serving as the head of uh, the law school of Apit Law School, Sri Lanka, and she is the senior lecturer of Department of Private and Comparative Law, Faculty of Law, University of Colombo. And Dr. Rose's uh, research uh, specializations on uh, family law, women's rights, child rights, legal philosophy, and gender rights. We are warmly welcome you to the departmental sessions, uh, Dr. Rose Vijay Sekar, Madam. And uh, uh, next we have uh, Dr. Yashodara Kadiragam Tambe. She is uh, the senior lecturer of Department of Legal Studies of Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences of Open University of Sri Lanka. Uh, Madam uh, Kadiragama Thambe's research specializations are law of delict, gender rights, and law of property. Warmly welcome uh, to our technical session, you, Madam, uh, Dr. Ashodara. And uh, okay, we'll. Uh, Move, uh, move to the uh, first speaker of the technical session three, uh, Madam uh, Malkanti Abeyratna. Uh, 
She is the senior lecturer of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. Her research specializations are evidence and criminal procedure, and her research interests are uh, property law and intellectual property law, equity and trust law, administrative law, company law, and comparative studies of Roman law. Today, Ms. Malkanti Aberatna, she's speaking on animals, property, and law, exploring a way forward. Over to you, Madam Aberatna. My research is on animals, property, and law, exploring a way forward. And uh, my research focuses on the research question, whether detrimental impact on animal interests will have an adverse impact on human interests as well. And it explores the hypothesis that enhancement of animal interests will in turn enhance human interests. The research is both uh, original and timely because the literature review uh, showed that animal interests have not been focused on in Sri Lanka in, the, um, in, legal, in legal writing. And also it is timely because as we all know, uh, we have COVID-19 global pandemic of 2020. Now, COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease, also known as a zoo nose. In zoonotic diseases, what happens is a disease that is in an animal is transmitted to a human. That is because the human being comes into contact with the bodily fluids of the infected animal. And what is of gravest concern is when there is a rapid human to human transmission thereafter. Uh, this is not the first time that zoonotic diseases have impacted on the entire world or a segment of it. We had MERS, we had SARS, uh, there is also Ebola, hemorrhagic fever, Spanish influenza. All these have come about because of zoonotic disease, diseases. So uh, bird flu, HIV, the bubonic plague, all these are zoonotic diseases which have had a detrimental impact on human beings. The start of COVID-19 is said to be the wet market uh, in South China, the Hunan seafood market. And uh, this is about perishable goods, the wet market. But in a corner of the wet market, you had a wildlife market where there was um, live meat or what is termed warm meat with on-demand slaughter of animals and skinning of carcasses. So there was obviously a great uh, likelihood of transmission of zoonotic diseases. Sri Lanka is also not a stranger to the eating of uh, the meat of wildlife because the Talagoya, the Relava, the Dandulena, and the Gona have often been consumed by uh, people in our society. And our society also has been exposed to zoonotic diseases, not on the scale of, of uh, infection like COVID-19, but leptospirosis or rat fever, dengue, rabies, and uh, ankylostomiasis or hookworm disease. In fact, the hookworm disease regulations was the carrier for the uh, COVID-19 regulations. The most important thing here is the human-animal interface and how law deals with that human-animal interface. The other important factor that we have to focus on here is that human beings are also animals. And so therefore it is a question of human animal to non-human animal interface actually. There are several big issues surrounding this interface. There is both the legal, the moral, the ethical, the religious and the scientific. Scientific is important because uh, of what new light is thrown up 
by new research on animals. Two of the most important concepts here is sentience and sapiens. We are homo sapiens, and therefore we have sapiens, the ability to think, reason, wisdom. Sentience is, on the other hand, the capacity to feel, perceive, or experience subjectively. Pleasure, pain, the need for food, water, shelter, freedom of movement, community life, and so on. We felt those very keenly during COVID-19 lockdown. And uh, most animals, nearly all animals, or every animal has sentience according to new research. Now, why have we come about this uh, human-animal interface? Some writers say it's because of what is termed speciesism. And speciesism is where a species, for us, the humans, have uh, demarcated as their species, the human species, as being better than any other species. So it's prejudice based on species alone. And we have focused on distinguishing fe features of humanity, uh, such as high intelligence, a highly complex language, and so on. But we also need to remember that there are segments of our own society, human beings, who actually lack some of those capabilities, but they are treated with respect and care, something that is not accorded to uh, animals. So what is important is how the legal system treats this interface and the balance of power that results. In the legal system, animals are property. So it's within the property law framework. Animals are owned by humans for the economic benefit of humans. So whether it's the Anglo-American common law system where animals are considered to be chattels or personal property, or the civil law tradition, the Roman Dutch law of Sri Lanka, where animals are movable property, rays or things, this balance of power being with the humans is very predominant. And so two primary normative legal entities, as you can see, persons and property. And the interests of persons are protected and animals as property have no interests other than their that of their human owners. And the human owners of animals get to determine the value of the animal property that they own. So as a result, we have instrumental treatment of animals, institutionalized exploitation of animals, whether for companionship, our pets, whether as a biological resource for food or clothing, think of farmed animals and the debacle about the mink farms in Denmark, which happened a couple of uh, weeks ago. Working animals, animals used for scientific experimentation, for entertainment and for hunting and trapping to provide a safer environment for human beings. So how do we arrive at an enlightened treatment of animals? We need to bring in the legal framework. And so the question is, can we actually go beyond mere property? The core purpose of a legal system is protection of the vulnerable. So we should have enough to uh, work with in the legal system. One first step is to work within the framework of property law and uh, to prevent exploitation, cruelty, neglect, and abuse. And um, in this, in Western uh, legal systems, you find uh, areas uh, of concern being highlighted. We, you, they draw inspiration from areas of law other than property law, victimhood, criminal law, uh, animals have been treated as crime victims where they have been abused, neglected, and uh, treated cruelly. Post-conviction possession bans, again from criminal law. Domestic violence protective orders drawn from criminal and family law. Pet custody orders, divorce laws. And then appointed court advocates for animals in cruelty, neglect, and abuse cases anti-tethering laws about tying up of animals, hot car laws, 
particularly appropriate for our country, but we don't take uh, dogs and pets in cars. Uh, hot car la laws where you can't keep animals in closed environments in cars. Then retail pet sale bans to prevent puppy meals, commercial breeding. And at a minimum, anyone who has anything to do with animals have been imposed with requirements to provide basic levels of care, food, water, shelter, and veterinary aid. So duty of care has been imposed and uh, regulatory measures surrounding commercial factory farming uh, about intensive and narrow confinement. Still working within the framework of property law, there is also the much talked about concept of designating animals as living property, still property, but living property because of their sentient nature. And that is uh, according respect for that. Outside of property law, you have the concept of legal personhood drawn from the law of persons. Uh, but here we may have to separate legal personhood from uh, the conceptualization of personhood and humanity. So it's a case by case basis and may not be all attributes of personhood. But why not? Because rivers and mountains in New Zealand and the river Ganges in India have been accorded personhood for protection. And then there is also something that goes really far, animal rights discourse, where you have the abolitionist theory of animal rights, where any sentient being has a basic right not to be treated as the property of others. So it's actually a policy of recognizing and valuing sentient beings. We have in Sri Lanka a Buddhist heritage coming of Arahat Mahinda, or tied up with animals and the hunting of deer, historical heritage of King Buddha Dasa, the physician king, who also treated animals, the um, evocative story of the stake being cured. Our Roman Dutch law um, provided for animals as property, as rays or things, and you also had the Actio de Pauperi and the Actio Legis Aquiliae. What about our welfare legislation? Animal welfare legislation is very patchy and far between. Principal act is the Animals Act of 1958. It deals with a motley collection of animal related activities, as you can see, transportation, branding, trespass, and breeding, which is ordinance principally dealing with slaughterhouses. Then prevention of cruelty to animals ordinance, which extraordinarily talks about unnecessary pain or suffering. Can pain or suffering ever be necessary? You have the municipal council's ordinance, which provides for stray cattle and pigs on the street and offensive trades. Nuisances ordinance about unwholesome meat being sold. Gaming ordinance where cockfighting uh, is uh, taken as amounting to gaming, and of course, the famous fauna and flora protection, which is mainly about commercial exploitation. Then, uh, going forward, for us in Sri Lanka, we need to think more about enhancing animal rights, but it's not a smooth path. Because for us, we have the issue of animal sacrifice, the use of bull hooks to uh, control large animals such as elephants, which brings us into the arena of the Perahara. We have farmed animals, we have working animals, and of course we have our zoos uh, and our habit of gifting elephants as, um, you know, nation-to-nation uh, -nation gifts. And now one of our elephants, Carbon, who was in Pakistan, has been freed and is in Cambodia. So it's not an easy path as you can see. But it's a path that we should and must travel on. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Malkanti Abhairatna, for a very interesting presentation on animal and
property uh, rights. So I would like to uh, go for the um, discussion forum now. So first, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Rose Vijay Sekara to make the comments and suggestions over Ms. Malkanti Abhayaratna's presentation. Over to you, madam. Thank you, Kaushani. Um, thank you, Ms. Malkanti, for a, for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation and selecting a very interesting topic. I, was, uh, I just had a brief look at your abstract. Um, now, after reading your abstract, I thought your presentation slightly differed from uh, the contents in the abstract. But of course, how can you ex express an idea within 300 or 350 words? So um, you made the research problem and the hypothesis very clear. I was just wondering whether you are trying to take animals uh, from the position of property, mere property, to a to a status beyond beyond being mere property to a status of living property. Uh, if you can explain a little bit on the rationale that you would use in order to justify the rights of animals, because. The basis for my question uh, arises from this uh, complexity that I was having in my mind. Now, if you take animals as a property, you know, property can be owned by any, anybody. And that property cannot claim rights. But if you take animals above that position, as a holder or holders of rights, then of course you have to recognize all animals, animals on air, animals in water, animals on land, as a species, as you described, as a species who, who should be given rights. Is that your basis? Are you adopting a rights basis to your thesis or do you adopt something else that you did not explain in your in your uh, presentation because if you are talking about rights then of course uh, we have to we can't uh, differentiate between uh, big animals like uh, elephants or uh, the pet, the animals that we keep as pets only, because we have to incorporate all species. So, if you can please explain us a little bit more. Uh, let me unmute myself. I hope you can hear me, Rose. Yes, Rose, you raise the most important point in looking at animals. And uh, it's specifically because of what you raised about the concept of rights, that I did not use the word rights in animal rights, property, and law. I didn't use the word rights there because that difficulty is there. Because when you accord rights, uh, one, who's going to activate that right? Because when you have a right, you should be able to enforce it. You, you, you have to follow up on it. So an animal can't do that. Now, Carvan the elephant can't march into court and demand that, you know, please free me. That doesn't happen. Someone has to work on his behalf. So that's why I traced that continuum within property as well as what writers do. Uh, like Gary Francio and a, a large number of writers do talk about animal rights. And if you look at the arena, the landscape, even in Sri Lanka, you have animal rights activists. People who are really searching for a better deal, if I may put it that way, for animals. And so you um, also pinpointed the concept which I used of living property. Now there, what you would seek to do is you're still within the property uh, 
rights uh, property law framework, but you're distinguishing an animal from, say, something like a mere table or a chair. Because a mere table or a chair it doesn't have life, doesn't feel pain. So within the property law concept itself, you are separating out a category for animals because they have life. Now, we may not come to the point of, say, rights, because it's, it's difficult. Who's going to, uh, you know, make sure that the rights are afforded? Of course, we can travel the same area, the same path that you are also familiar with. What about children? The children would have the parents, the courts as upper guardian. So there is already uh, a strand of thinking in law itself that uh, we might be able to use. But you see, we have all got so used to the fact that this is ours, this is property, we can do what we like with it. And that's why I mentioned Denmark as well. About 3 million, 3 million mink, little animals, like little, you know, fairly big, but not as big as, say, uh, a cat or a dog, uh, were killed were killed in Denmark about two to three weeks ago simply because they got COVID and a different strain of COVID. So because they were part of farming, farmed animals for mink coats, so they were just killed. So you got rid of COVID, this, uh, this aberration of COVID, by killing three million mink. And there was a huge problem thereafter about burying, but never mind that. But so you see, um, do we as animals ourselves uh, forget to use our sapience or our reasoning and thereby think only of ourselves? And this is a part of sustainable development. This is a part of environmental protection. Do we also realize that we also have to be trustees of animals as well. So it's a difficult part. Arriving at the concept of animal rights is not an easy part. It's a very, very difficult one. And that's why you may have stages within it where you may move to better treatment of animals, to actually designating them as living property, and then perhaps even personhood. If you can designate a river and a mountain as a legal person for the purpose of protecting that uh, entity, now it's an entity, uh, why can't you extend it to, I mean, the river doesn't feel pain. The river doesn't feel hunger, you might say that. Uh, for the river, and the mountain in New Zealand, and for the river Ganges in India, it's spiritual. There is a spiritual aspect to that protection. So that perhaps is what is actually being safeguarded, because the river and the mountain in New Zealand are important to the Maori people, and Ganges is important in Hinduism. So there is the human being which might protect it, might come up to support cases in respect of it. But for animals, it's going to be very, very difficult. Now, in the Animal Welfare Bill, which, you know, is still not seeing the light of day, they suggested a sort of a, a panel of trustees who might take care of it. I think it causes a lot of difficulty. That's why 2006 to 2010, 20, we still haven't seen anything on animal welfare. But thank you. You asked a very very interesting question which helped to expand and I really do value that because um, that's important I think to realize that how difficult this part is going to be. Thank you Ms. Malkanti. So in conclusion even though the research is ongoing in at least for the moment uh, the man-made legal system still maintains its superiority over, correct, over animals correct. as well as over property. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ross Vijayasekara. Thank you very much, Madam, for your very valuable uh, comments uh, regarding uh, Ms. Malkanti Abhayaratna's presentation. And now I would like to uh, uh, invite uh, Dr. Yashodara Kadiragama Tambe uh, for uh, the com uh, her comments uh, regarding Madam Abhayaratna's presentation. Over to you, Madam. Very presentation. It's a timely. And I have few comments, like I just, uh, after, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Rose asked a question, then you explain and I'm clear. Now, actually, I think you are more focusing on the welfare of the animals. So I just, uh, I just uh, asking you, because based on your research questions, I'm just looking at the methodology, I think it's, your, you have followed the doctrinal method. So I would like to just suggest Malkanti because there is not much research is done in even in Sri Lanka uh, in this aspect. So why don't you go beyond non-doctrinal research methodology where you can, you know, go interviews and questionnaire. Like there are a lot of organizations, individuals work on animal welfare. So I think because, uh, because now uh, you have, you know, explain the gaps in our present law, we, it is not giving much importance to, you know, welfare of the animal. So, therefore, what I feel is that you can go beyond the doctrinal uh, part of your research methodology. And I would like to also ask, like, you have mentioned some, you know, examples from Western, you know, Western countries, how these uh, they, uh, welfare of the animals are protected. So I'm wondering, so I just know the reason why you have just taken only the Western, you know, uh, uh, perspective. So is there any room, you know, you can develop, like even in, de we are a developing country, so why don't we look at in some other, you know, developing countries where how maybe like in India or uh, the, uh, in South Asian context, uh, how these when, uh, welfare of the animal is looking after by the legislations. So those are my comments, uh, Markanti. Thank you. And yeah, thank you. That's all. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ashwadara Khadiragam Thambe. Thank you very much for your valuable comments. So I will go for the next uh, presentation. Uh, Ms. Jaykala Jairendram. Uh, she is the probationary lecturer of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. Uh, her research interests are in uh, law of interpretation and statutes and documents and law of contract and environmental law. She's presented today on the topic of comparative analysis on the role of the judiciary in protecting the rights of nature in Sri Lanka. Ms. Jaikala Jairendram, over to you. Comparative analysis on the role of the judiciary in protecting the rights of nature in Sri Lanka. The globe and its features not only belong to the human beings but belong to the entire diversified ecosystem in common. Humans also share the globe with its other creatures, and nothing is superior to the other. This concept was not correctly understood in many occasions and the man-made activities for their development purposes destroy and affect the environment very badly. This research intends to examine the importance to provide and protect the rights of nature in Sri Lanka. The main objective is the research. Uh, the main objective of the research is to evaluate the existing legal framework of the law relating to environmental protection in Sri Lanka and to examine the best possible ways to incorporate modern developments in rights of nature by judicial interpretation. Sri Lanka has a rich ecosystem diversity due to different climate, soil and other geographical conditions. The legal framework relating to environmental protection is also broad in this country. However, it is observed that these protections available under the legal framework are only ensured by uh, legal, um, actions brought by natural or legal persons. Therefore, nature has no say when its rights are violated by human activities. Although recognizing the rights of nature will require new legislations, recognizing the nature as a legal personality through judicial interpretation as a first move uh, in Sri Lanka will help to protect and preserve the ecosystem diversity in the country. 
Sri Lanka is a developing country where tension between economic development and environmental protection is inevitable. Decided cases evident that uh, the fact some of the administrative decisions only focus on economic development and in this occasions, judiciary plays a major role in ensuring environmental protection in order to move towards a more sustainable economic development. What is rights of nature for justice? As correctly pointed out by Professor Christopher D. Stone, likewise, co co uh, companies, corporations, states, estates are given legal personalities. Even though they cannot speak, lawyers speak on behalf of them. Therefore, it can be um, arguable. It can. It is arguable that nature can also be given legal personality. Sri Lanka's ecosystem diversity is a part of the livelihood of its people. Thus, rights of population in the country contribute to a speedy organization process and lead to overuse of natural resources and harm the nature. Why judicial interpretation is important in protecting the rights of nature in Sri Lanka. We have uh, a rich number of legislations to protect the environment. On the other hand, the judiciary's role to protect the environment as a guardian is uh, uh, remarkable through decided cases. Though there are number of numerous legislations available, the judiciary's role evident that um, they act as guardians to protect the environment. The role of judiciary in environmental protection in Sri Lanka. Right to life or right to a healthy environment is not expressly provided under the constitution of Sri Lanka, which is the supreme law of the country. However, it is observed that the judiciary of Sri Lanka has guaranteed right to life and right to a healthy environment by interpreting the provisions of the constitution in many decided cases. There are two set of references can be identified in the constitution relating to environment. First is the fundamental rights chapter and the second is chapter on directed principles of state policies of, uh, and fundamental duties. Under the fundamental rights chapter, Environmental justice upon the applications made by the affected individuals or the non-governmental organizations along with the affected parties are uh, brought under the fundamental rights chapter. However, the fundamental rights or the state directive principles are being used to protect the environment for the people as they are depending on it and not as a right of the nature. Therefore, it appears important to allow the nature to protect itself through accessing the codes without waiting for someone who is directly affected by the harm caused to nature to file an action for the nature. Legal recognition for rights of nature in India. India has a diversified ecosystem like Sri Lanka and the role of judiciary in protecting the environment is remarkable through landmark judgments. Although the nature was not provided or a given express recognition of legal personality in India, uh, the approaches of the judiciary towards protecting the nature of, um, and guaranteeing its rights are impressive. In the decided case of Welfare Board of India versus Nagaraja and others, it was stated that right to dignity and fair treatment is therefore not confined to human beings alone, but to animals as well. In another decided case of State of Gujarat versus um, Mizapur, Moti, Qureshi, and others, it was expressed. Article 51A, subarticle G of the Constitution, was interpreted by stating that it is a fundamental duty of every citizen in India to, to have compassion for living creatures. In the case of Thien Bodhavarman, Tirumulpat versus Union of India, it was uh, expressed that environmental justice could be achieved only if we drift away from the principle of anthropocentric to ecocentric. It enumerates that the courts in India have taken steps to protect the rights of other creatures in the country from human activities. It is observed from the discussion that legal personhood has not and should not be restricted to human beings only, hence directly or indirectly, the judiciary 
in India seem to contribute in the protection of the nature and its rights by giving legal recognition to the parts of nature through decided cases. Sri Lankan courts have long history in introducing and applying the legal principles introduced by Indian courts and refer to Indian judgments. Therefore, it can be recommended that the judiciary in Sri Lanka could contribute to protect the nature and its rights through judicial interpretation under the existing legal framework in the absence of separate legislation on this matter. Constitutional recognition for rights of nature under the uh, constitutional uh, constitution of Ecuador. Constitution of the Republic of Ecuador 2008 is the first in the world to declare nature as subject with rights. It is observed that the right to a healthy environment and protection of the ecosystem are expressly guaranteed under the Constitution. Article 71 of the Constitution provides that all persons, communities, peoples and nations can call upon public authorities to enforce the rights of nature. The constitutional recognition for rights of nature under the uh, constitution, under their constitution, gives an idea as to the importance of protecting the nature like other creatures in the ecosystem. Therefore, it is recommended that protecting the rights of nature can be achieved by incorporating provisions relating to this matter through the amendment to the constitution in Sri Lanka as it is the supreme law of the country. As the judicial history of Sri Lanka evident that the judiciary did not stick to textualism where the plain meaning to the provisions lead to injustice and the courts have adopted a purposive approach to bring about justice. This approach can be followed to introduce the rights of nature in Sri Lanka under the existing legal framework in the absence of a separate legal provision. This paper concludes by stating that recognizing the nature or some part of the natural world as having legal personality through judicial interpretation is an inevitable move in today's world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kala Jairendram, for your presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, go for the comments of uh, Dr. Rose Vijayasekara regarding uh, Mr. Ekala's presentation. Madam, uh, over to you. Thank you, Chaikala, for a wonderful presentation. Congratulations. Uh, so it's so it's it's really really nice to see you all uh, presenting on wider topics, though your your uh, abstract your your the concept looks very uh, limited, it is not, because the idea behind your main research problem is huge. On the one hand, it's quite innocent, I would say, but on the other hand, it's very, very powerful to recognize nature itself as a rights holder. I was now wondering when you started presenting, why should we protect the nature? Is it because uh, people, human beings require the uh, nature? Is that why we should protect the nature? Or should we protect the nature for its own benefit, for its own right? And on the other hand, the, the second element of your research is the judicial interpretation, the role of the judiciary in protecting the nature. You know, judiciary consists of human beings. Therefore, their interpretations are very much subjective. Unless the judiciary recognizes nature as a rights holder, they can do disasters through their judgments. And you know very well, when you say judicial construction, it consists of construction or the interpretation of the, the substance of the law, which is very much influenced by the structure of the law and the culture of the law. So when you say judicial construction of something, it, it includes all these aspects. So, 
So the judiciary, the entire legal system, the substance, the culture, and the structure of the legal system should recognize nature as a rights holder. It's it's a beautiful idea, Jayakala. Congratulations. Thank you very for much. For having courage to, to come up with such a, such a strong idea. Thank you very much, Madam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ross Jessica. I hope uh, Ms. Jaikala will be really happy uh, out of uh, our Dr. Ross's comments. It's really, really interesting. So I will uh, uh, go for Dr. Yashodara Kadiragama Thambi. Madam, uh, uh, over to you for comments uh, regarding Ms. Jaikala's presentation. Madam, uh, kindly uh, switch on your mic if possible, please. Uh, thank you. Right. Uh, I'll just make a quick, uh, uh, because we are running out of time, I think. Uh, I think I just want to mention, Jayakara, that uh, when you compare with India and Sri Lanka, because Article 21 is there, actually it paved the way for the judiciary, Indian judiciary to, you know, go for progressive realization of these uh, judicial I mean, interpretation. So that is one thing. I think you have mentioned in your presentations that the constitution should be amended, uh, but I couldn't see what are the specific amendments that you are suggesting. Maybe you, are, so you might have suggested in the paper, but I couldn't see uh, the one. And the, again, I think you have to appreciate the Indian judiciary also because directive principles of state policy, we just merely consider as guidelines, but when you take Indian judiciary, they actually think it's part of the Indian constitution. It's kind of they are giving a equal positions with fundamental rights jurisdiction. And also, I would like one more comment. When you make a comparison with some other countries, it's better just to give a justification why you have taken those two countries. So that's all my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, madam. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, madam uh, uh, Yashodara. Uh, so we'll move into the next uh, presentation. Uh, this presentation is Ms. Satya Seelan Janani, Ms. Janani. So Ms. Janani is the probationary lecturer of the Department of Private and Comparative Law, and her research interests are in private international law, uh, information technology law, new trends of contracts under information technology era, and land law. So today she is speaking on global rights to land, need for the recognition of the rights to lands with the emergence of private international law. I hope the presentation will be very interesting. So over to you, Janani. Janani, you are muted. Janani, we can't uh, hear you. Yes, madam. Uh, give, give us a little time, madam. Wait. based on recognizing the global rights to land in front of a panel who are already in the top of this research area. The global rights to land need for the recognition of right to lands with the emergence of private international law. Before I take you into the study of this research, I would like to familiarize you into the two key phrases that I have used throughout my research area. One is private international law. Private international law is a branch of jurisprudence arising from the diverse laws of various nations that applies when private citizens of different countries interact or transact business with one another. And also, it refers to the part of law that is administered between private citizens of different countries 
is concerned with the definition, regulation, and enforcement of rights of consideration where both the persons in whom the right incurs and the person upon whom the obligation rests are private citizens of different nations. Thus, it is a set of rules and regulations that are established or agreed upon by the citizens of different nations who privately enter into a transaction and that will govern in the event of a dispute. In this respect, private international law differs from public international law, which is the set of rules entered into by the government of various countries that determine the rights and regulate the intercourse of different nations. And second is the Global Right Alliance. This phrase has been used throughout the study to refer the inalienable ability of individuals to freely obtain, use, and possess the lands at their discretion without any discrimination, even without the barriers of citizenship, as long as their activities on the land do not impede on other individuals. But does the right to land actually exist under international law? The traditional answer to this question would be no. As it was held in the case of Johnson's versus M. Itosh, the right to land especially is and must be admitted to depend entirely on the law of nation in which they lie. As a matter of public international law, the domain power over the lands always vested within the ambit of state sovereignty. And it is believed that the sovereignty of a state is vested upon the exclusiveness of one such state to regulate its own laws and rules to the matters connected to the rights and obligations of lands. The states are always vested with the domain power over the land situated within its territory. Even the existing government of a state has the right to acquire the lands which are under private ownership, and this has been held and upheld by a series of case laws in various states. Therefore, the international society did not envisage for a separate branch of laws which governs the land rights. Even this conventional notion also has been supported by the jurisprudence of legal positivism, where it depends that the lands exist only to the extent recognized by the national government. In this sense of legal positivism, the land law stems from a vertical relationship between the state and its citizen. However, the development and the advancement of private international law has led to the emergence of a new trend in recognizing land rights, and thus the concept of global right to lands has emerged along with several debates by rewriting and redrafting this conventional notion. The research problem in this study has entirely been a matter of recognition. In the field of international law, the existence of a right, obligation, or an entitlement is always has been a matter of recognition. But although the private international law has led to the emergence of the concept of global right to lands and stresses the need for its recognition, there are such profound legal implications that expressly recognize the global right to lands and the interests connected to land rights. And still, almost many of the states expressly deny or restrict the right to lands when there is a foreign element or a foreigner is involved in a particular land transaction. For example, the Land Restriction on Alienation Act number 38 of 2014 of Sri Lanka would be a best example for this. Meanwhile, on the other hand, many countries even do not recognize the land rights at least at their level, national levels. Although the existence of international law uh, 
regime does not provide for the express recognition to the land rights. Now that the need has arose, it is assumed that the recognition could be supported by the right-based approach to the legal jurisprudence held as the hypothesis of this research. And also, the main idea behind this study was to make a theoretical contribution to the existing legal domain by introducing the concept of global right to lands. But apart from introducing the concept, it was also aimed to analyze the feasibility of recognizing the concept in the sphere of private international. As a main idea behind this research was to provide a normative value by the of a theoretical contribution. The research was mainly based on the doctrinal method of legal research and the use of legal theories were utilized to provide a jurisprudential and a theoretical background to justify the hypothesis of the research. And in order to attain the objective of the research, the following questions were well examined during the study of this research. The first one was whether and to what extent the need for the recognition of global right to land exists. And the second was what will be the underlying principle upon which the global right to land will given its legal recognition. And sec third one, what will be the effect of the global right to lands if the legal recognition is given to this concept? And in lining with the first research question, the, find, the first finding to this study is that since the foreign courts under private international have law have law have to deal with the rights and interests of the peoples of different nations, it is essential to ensure that the parties are vested within those rights at the first instance. Thus, in a situation where the disputes arise with regard to the interest of rights connected to lands among the citizens of two different nations, the right to lands should be available to both parties at the time of the dispute in order to obtain a just order or a determination. Therefore, there is a necessary implication for the need of recognizing the global right to lands. And several other factors to have led to the need for recognizing the global right to land, namely, the effect of globalization, the development of, of the culture of dual citizenship, migration, whether it could be temporary, permanent, or work-based, and finally, and most importantly, the cross-border investment and cross-border trade activities. Rationalizing the concept through right-based approaches was the third uh, finding of this research. And this was the most significant finding of the research where it was based on the second question to the research area. And also which this validates the hypothesis of the research. There are several steps that has been already taken by a favor of the international instrument to recognize the rights to property as a substantial human right, which can be utilized to recognize the land rights by giving a creative interpretation. For example, Article 17 of the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights declares that everyone has a right to own property alone as well as in association with others, and no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of this property. However, it is noteworthy that the enforcement of international land law through human right norms presents too many challenges. And also, they do not specifically deal with land rights. They merely uh, deal with the property rights in, a, in other hand. And also, on the other hand, still the existing human right rules are subjected to the sovereign right of each individual state. But the fourth finding to the, uh, finding to the research 
ev uh, evident that it is uh, evident that there are few examples of international conventions that are already functioning with the coordination of several states in terms of property rights, which can be implied to apply to the matters concerned to lands by giving a creative interpretation. Such global standards have had been created in relation to the creation of bills in tested succession estate administration, trust, and marital property. By stressing the importance of recognizing the concept of global right to land again in this presentation, I will finally conclude my presentation by making the implication to the effects of recognizing the global rights to land. Thus, Recognizing the global rights to lands will create a set of uniform and harmonized rules in private international law. Either it could be expressed or implied, can be in, uh, applied for the land disputes where private individuals are concerned. And second, it will provide a mechanism to recognize the rights to land even at the national level of the states and it will mitigate the arbitrary acquisition of land. Thus, this will, lead to the imp uh, this will lead to implement a public policy endorsed by the global community when the states tend to exercise the eminent domain power when they acquire, or acquire private owned lands. However, it is also important to note that on the other hand, Recognizing the concept of global right to lands will necessarily restrict the scope of the traditional norms on the sovereignty of each state. Saying that, I will finally conclude uh, my presentation at this juncture, and I am thankful for listening to me uh, during this short time period. And also, I, I will, I would, I would like to thank for giving me the opportunity to present at this forum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Janani. Uh, it's uh, really interesting on private international law and uh, the global uh, rights on land. So I would like to uh, uh, listen to uh, Dr. Ross Vijay Sekara first uh, regarding uh, Ms. Janani's presentation. Madam, over to you. Uh, Thank you, Chanani. Uh, it was a very good presentation. And uh, as uh, Kaushani pointed out, you, do, you have touched a, a very important aspect of law, private international law. And uh, in private international law, uh, I know this aspect has not been addressed adequately. Uh, Dr. Yashodara will have uh, more to add to your presentation, but just to... Uh, share my thoughts uh, on this area. I don't agree with Article 17 of the UDHR uh, because uh, sustainability and justice require that nobody should be able to own property. Because if you let anybody own something, uh, that means that he or she or they can do whatever they want with the property with whatever they, so with the property, uh, land specifically, because it's such a, such an important asset. The entire humanity should be able to enjoy. So if we allow individuals or communities own that, uh, the future generations may find May, may may face to uh, uh, face consequences that are against justice so i mean we know i'm sure you 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 are aware of john ross concept of justice uh, saving for the future generations is one important uh, concept of justice so sustainable development which is reflected in the 2030 Global Development Agenda is that 
is based on the concept of justice, just savings principle. So if you just, uh, I would suggest that instead of using right to land, well, how about using rights in land? Uh, yes, Madam. Uh, even I wanted to emphasize on the all the rights which are connected to lands, not only the possession or the ownership, right. all, all right. the other exclusive rights of land. Thank yes. you, Madam. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ross Vijay Sekar. It's a nice comment, actually. And uh, uh, Dr. Yashodhara Kadiragama Tambe, over to you for the uh, make the comments on journalist presentation. I think you were you were eagerly waiting uh, for uh, the presentation. <laughs> so over to you. Actually, yes, uh, uh, Janani, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. I do agree with Dr. Uh, Ross Vijay Sekar. Uh, because this concept of sustainability and things. Um, but I would like to make a, a, a very specific, I have to ask two questions because one is that you, uh, uh, you in your presentation, your paper also agreed that international law so far, you know, does not recognize the uh, right to land. I think uh, Dr. Yashodara unexpectedly faced some uh, connection errors, maybe. Uh, so uh, shall we uh, uh, just uh, wait? Okay. Janani can answer, no? Janani can respond if you're willing to. Uh, so, madam, uh, but the question was not clear to me, madam. I didn't hear the question. Uh, let me check with uh, uh, Dr. Kadira Gamatambi. Just give me a few minutes. Yes, ma'am. I hope uh, there's a power failure uh, regard uh, on uh, Dr. Kadri Gamatambe's uh, place. So because of that, she left uh, uh, left from the session. So we'll have her. We'll, we'll try to contact her, uh, reconnect her soon, and uh, take uh, your comments uh, regarding Janani's presentation. So uh, so we'll wait for that thing. So uh, until then, we'll move to the next uh, session, next uh, presenter. Uh, Ms. Buddhika Munasingha. Uh, she's the probationary lecturer of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. And her research interests are in land law, law of property, human rights, and Roman law. She is presenting today on the topic of critical analysis of the law relating to human billboard in and the evolution of the concept of commodification of human skin. Over to you, Ms. Buddhika, uh, for to presentation. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to have the opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. Let me introduce myself. I am Buddhika Munasingha. What I'd like to present to you today is about the law relating to human will body. As you can see on the screen, my topic today is critical analysis of the law relating to human will body and the evolution of the concept of the commodification of human skin. I'd like to start this presentation with two stories of the world of the human billboarders. The first one is about Billy Gabby. Billy has a wife and five kids to feed. Therefore, now he is working as a human billboarder or a skin vertizer to a company named Postergator.com. Aside from Postergator, he also has a number of other websites, mostly defunct tattooed all over his body. Not only does he have Postergate.com tattooed on him, but he has also legally changed his name to Postergator.com in 2011. You can see his new identity card on the screen. 
It reportedly cost to the company $15,000 for this unusual advertisement stunt, according to the B. He said that he did all these things because he wanted to save his family. Let's move on to the second scenario. In October 2011, two graduating Oxford University students launched a project for a private company named Buy My Face, through which the advertisers could pay to promote their businesses, products, or services by having their brands painted on the students' faces while the students committed to using revenues to pay off their students' debt. The second scenario, all these scenarios shows the tendency of using human bodies as canvases for advertising messages and branding even though these things will be inevitably leads to the downfall of the civilization. Therefore, this presentation is structured as follows. Firstly, I'd like to provide very brief introduction about the concept of human billboarding, and then I'd like to describe research problems, research objectives, and limitations of the research. After that, I'd be looking at the research methodology, and then I'd like to discuss the law relating to human skin as advertising space and the conflict of laws relating to the human skin. So, Human billboards have been around for centuries, but their presence and the form today different somewhat from their historical predecessors. A human billboard can identify as some person who put on an advertisement on his or her person. This can be practicing via someone holding or wearing a sign of some sort, but also this can be include someone wearing advertising as clothing a fourth point, this human billboarding can be practiced by having advertising tattooed on the human body. In the trade literature, human body has been used to refer to a widely array of advertising techniques that in the several ways transaction to the body boundaries between the human from the advertisement. As we discussed earlier, even though the still there has been some kind of immense commercial Communicating potential and the consumer attractions in the human body or human skill, human skin. At the end of this process, human body becomes the medium that carries the advertising messages. This leads to the concept of the commodification of human skin. Therefore, the research problem can be identified as follows. Do the existing legal frameworks provide an adequate protection against the commercialization of human skin via skin billboarding to ensure the rights of the human holder, human skin holders by providing the full enjoyment of human rights and how the conflict of laws over the human skin finally affects the concept of individual autonomy and the right to bodily integrity. This research limits itself only to consider the laws in the United States of America and the United Kingdom. Those countries have developed cultural culture of human skin billboard in as a newly recognized green way of advertising methods. The main purpose of this research is to explain the problematic nature of the existing laws relating to the human skin billboarding and to make effective Recommendations to ensure the rights to skin holders who agree to act as skin billboarders. And also, I'd like to mention how this conflict of laws over human skin finally affected the concept of individual autonomy and the right to bodily integrity. I'd now like to move on to the research methodology. Basically, this is a qualitative research, so I mainly focused on the secondary sources like legislation, case laws, international conventions, law reports, and the electronic databases. So let's move on to the discussion of this research. Basically, this research is based on the concept of human billboarding, which can be identified as a concept with use the human body as a space for an advertising purposes. Generally, human skin is the largest organ in the human body. People use this human skin for various purposes. Some people use human skin as a mode of expression, but on the other hand, some people use human skin as a commercial property. So in this scenario, it is very important to identify that law should be looking into these issues very deeply. First of all, I'd like to consider the history of these laws or the practices led to the human skin as a mode of expression, especially in the ancient Romans and Greeks used tattooing to penalize slaves, criminals, and prisoners of war at the same time 
Some people use tattooing for spiritual and decorative purposes. However, in the modern era, people started to directly deal with the concept of the commodification of human biological materials, including human skin, with the advancement of the science and the technology. The concept of human skin billboarding and using disembodied human skin in various productions by companies also directly connected with the commodification of human skin. In this context, human skin billboarding the seller's skin transformed into a commercial space which has alienable economical property rights. Those can be enjoyed by the third parties via agreements. And in the context of using disembodied human skin happened via commercial agreements or transactions between bio companies and hospitals or tissue banks. But this approach of alienability of human skin hasn't had legal validity because of the notion in alienability of the human biological materials via commercial transactions, which questioned the theory of the individual bodily integrity widely accepted and highly prized social norms, even though there are some property rights granted over creations based on the human skin under the, property, under the copyright law regime. However, this paper intends to discuss all these happenings very deeply. Here you can see some kind of examples happening in the modern era with regarding to the human skin billboarding. Apart from these examples, there is a rich case law jurisdictions which accepting no property laws in the human body. Moore versus Regents of University of California is the best example for that. However, in the recent case of Earworth and others versus North Bristol in a trust, the Court of Appeal for England and Wales revisited the property debate and threw into a doubt several doctrines with respect to a property and the body. Even though this approach clearly away towards the notion of the commodification of human biological materials by granting property rights to the human body in the exceptional circumstances, it is not universally accepted yet. If we trace into the current law relating to the non commodification of human skin, there are most notable provisions and laws protect the concept of the commodification of human body and its body parts apart from the case law jurisdiction. According to the Human Tissue Act of United Kingdom, no one can buy, sell, or otherwise deal directly or indirectly with the human biological materials other than the blood. Also, the no property rights in the human rights also protect from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the Universal Declaration of on Bioethics and Human Rights. However, even though there are laws and policies relating to the concept of prohibition of the commodification of human biological materials, at the same time, the lawmakers provide property law rights over human biological materials, which goes to the commodification of human skin by granting intellectual property rights over human biological materials under the patent and copyright law regimes or recognize human skin as a tangible medium of expression under the copyright and granting patent rights to the human biological materials which subject to human labor and skill under the section one or two of the copyright act of the united states of america grants copyrights over the tattoos and this has been identified in several case laws including cartoon network lp versus csc holding incorporation this case status that a tangible medium of expression can be a paper canvas wall or even skin Therefore, arguably most notable cases which relate into the tattoos also accept the right copyright over the human tissue skin. Warner Brothers Studio and Mike Tyson's tattoo case is a very famous case that a court granted a copyright copyright to the Mike Tyson's tattoo artist. Now you can see there is a huge gap between laws relating to the human billboarding and the laws relating to the human biomaterials. Therefore, I'd like to present few solutions that can be recognized as proposed recommendations. First of all, there should be a specific law or regulatory framework to resolve these controversial issues relating to the human skin. And also creating a specific and definite regulatory framework based on the consent of the person can be a temporary remedy to protect the rights of the human skin. But it 
cannot consider as a sufficient remedy because of the rapid development of the biotechnologies. Therefore, we have to create or develop a theoretical foundation which can address the issue emerging in the field of law relating to the human body. So, as I mentioned earlier, even though the human skin has acquired immense value in the market economy, still the accepted principle is that people cannot have the control over their own body or no one has the right to commodity their own body or its biological parts. In this context, also the owner of the skin cannot gain any financial gains over his or her skin, even though the third party companies own a huge amount of profits by using disembodied Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Buddhika Munasingha. Uh, actually, I also was thinking about what is a uh, human billboard. In, so it's regarding tattoos. Actually, it's really, really interesting. Thank you, uh, madam. It's really, really interesting. So uh, I hope I hope you all can hear me, no? OK. So uh, I would like to uh, have the comments of Dr. Ross Jaysekara regarding Ms. Buddhika Munasingha's presentation. I hope you have nice comments uh, for her presentation. It's waiting for you, madam. <laughs> Seriously. Unfortunately, Kaushani, Buddhika spoke a language that I hardly understood. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm clueless about uh, this uh, human billboarding and uh, this uh, laws to regulate skin. Of course, it's, it must be an emerging area uh, interesting uh, choice, Buddhika. Um, just if you can, if you concluded by saying that we must uh, develop uh, or create a theoretical foundation or a theoretical basis uh, in order to improve or in order to build a law upon. So uh, what would be your uh, recommendation? As a, as a theoretical basis. What kind of a theory would best suit this law? Uh, thank you very much, madam. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that there are so many uh, proper, proprietary theories relating to the property, but when it's come to the human body, no one identified human body as a property because of the notion that we are saying no one can own or no one can buy human body. Therefore, we should go for a new uh, theory that can be based on the property law theories, but it it should be and it, it must be separated from from this uh, separated from uh, from this um, I'm really, really sorry about this uh, technical errors madam uh, this uh, new theory should be coming through the property law theories but it shouldn't be the same as property property law theories because if we go for a property law theories madam then definitely uh, the commodification of human body ma biomaterials can be happening that is not good for a humankind but when when if we can identify new law area like we are talking about the intellectual property law but before that we don't have that kind of law and uh, we also talking about now we are talking about the industrial law before that we don't have that kind of laws i think now we go for a new law like this kind of law relate law of the body then we can identify uh, body theory law uh, basis on law of the body so uh, madam there are a few um, le lo legal luminaries are researching in this area but th this is very newly concept and there are there are uh, there are no very huge uh, legal literatures on this so i think uh, according to my view and uh, the findings uh, that i have found i identified that uh, this uh, law of the body or the theory uh, some theory uh, based on the body should be come under the property law regime but be, uh, we have to separate that um, theory um, by um, providing some kind of um, uh, we have to based on the uh, humanity and also we have to think about the rights of the uh, body holders or the skin holders madam thank you very much Thank you, Buddhika. So, 
the uh, faculty of law uh, has a has a has a up and coming uh, researcher to add to the to the emerging area but uh, uh, i i reserve my my comments with regard I mean, how can you consider uh, somebody's skin as a property uh, it sounds quite a bit weird anyway all the best to your research uh, the adventurous uh, <laughs> research efforts thank you very much thank you thank very you. much madam thank you very much uh, dr ross vijay sekar thank you and thank you ms buddhika actually uh, unfortunately dr yashodara had to uh, leave the session due to uh, power failure we were we are still we are waiting for her but uh, she uh, i think yet to be connected so uh then we'll uh, move to the next session the last session of uh, today uh, the third se technical session so miss danushika abe ratna uh she is the probationary lecturer of the department of private and comparative law her research interests are in, on medical law family law women's rights and children's rights uh she's speaking today on the topic of surrogate mothering feminist analysis on enhancing or restricting freedom i hope the presentation will be very awesome and very interesting so uh, ms danshika over to you for your presentation a very good afternoon dear sir madam and college i am danshika beratna uh, today my presentation is going to be on uh, surrogate mothering Uh, if a mis analysis on enhancing or restricting freedom um, my presentation is going to be structured according to this dream of having their own child is a central part of human lives which is formed for a thousand of years if someone is unable to conceive by their own there are modern assisted reproductive technologies well which help parents to have their own child surrogacy is one such method The literal meaning of surrogate is substitute or replacement. So a surrogate mother is a substitute mother. Surrogacy is not a new concept, and you can read stories even in the Holy Bible. I am not going to explain those story because of the limited time. The research problem of this study is to find whether the surrogate mother in enhances or restricts the freedom of surrogate mothers in Sri Lanka under the liberal and radical feminist perspectives. And these research questions will be addressed through this research. This research is based only on liberal and radical feminist perspectives, and also will be discussed only through the perspective of surrogate mother. This is the methodology I adapted to conduct this research, and I'm not going to explain this further because of the limited. I adapted two different feminist views, namely liberal feminism and radical feminism, and there are a few reasons to choose these feminist perspectives to analyze surrogate mothering. Liberal feminism considers human beings as rational, autonomous, and self-interested individuals, and they strongly value liberty. Contemporary liberal feminists focused on emphasizing reproductive rights in early years. There, these are the main reasons to choose liberal feminism to analyze uh, surrogate mothering, and also because bodily autonomy and reproductive freedom is directly connected with the surrogate mothering. And then I choose uh, radical feminism mainly because they discuss about the oppression of women by male patriarchy. They are explaining that patriarchy is based in an oppression family structure within which women's sexuality and reproductive capacity are controlled. One of the important points some radical feminists endorse is that the patriarchy supported violence against women and threats of violence against women, particularly if women step outside the roles assigned to her in family. at the end of this research you will see that the, how the patriarchy affects towards surrogate mother in, in sri lanka and also they are argue that revolutionary change that challenges a full range of patriarchal institutions including family needs to liberate women further the world in speaking out and organizing for the right to choose abortion it can be argued that surrogate mothering can be considered as the other end of abortion 
These are the reasons to choose these two feminist perspectives to analyze the surrogate mothering and women's freedom. First, the researcher is going to analyze the women's right to become a surrogate mother. Surrogate motherhood is directly connected with bodily autonomy. Every human being's right to life carries with it as an intrinsic part of its rights to bodily autonomy and integrity. Article 16 of CEDO also discuss about this and the reproductive freedom. There is a general tendency in the literature to use the concept of reproductive freedom in the context of women's right to bodily self-determination or control over one's body. Do the women really enjoy the reproductive freedom? Authors like Jonathan Hill and Jesse Wall suggest that becoming pregnant as the result of a sex act between a married couple does not necessarily mean that the woman enjoyed her reproductive freedom. Even in Sri Lanka, where marital rape and abortion is not recognized, the child could be born without the consent of the mother, the woman. Compared to these situations, surrogate mothering can be claimed as enhancing the women's bodily autonomy and reproductive freedom because they are the surrogate mother can choose whether she is ready to bear a child, whether she is ready to become a mother and when to make the arrangement, when to make the surrogacy agreement. And of course, not like in the past, there is no sexual intercourse involved in modern surrogacy. Firestone Danny mentioned that the development of artificial reproduction as a means of eliminating patriarchy by freeing women from the burden of reproduction. But in Sri Lanka, according to one of my previous researches, I will show you the results later. It was evident through a field research that the Sri Lankan surrogate women become surrogate mothers in order to help financial to her family or to support one of her female uh, family members. Uh, the question arises is, if it is for bodily autonomy, can a surrogate mother terminate a pregnancy? Under the section 300 of the Act number 38 of uh, Children's Act, num uh, Children's Act 2005, South African mothers enjoy this right as well. They can terminate pregnancy, surrogate mothers can terminate pregnancy, but before that she should inform her decision to the commission parents as well. So it can be argued that due to the lack of regulatory mechanism on surrogacy, Sri Lankan women do not enjoy the, uh, her reproduction freedom and bodily autonomy to the fullest, not even in natural birth of a child uh, due to the lacuna of the laws. Lacunas in the law such as marital rape and uh, abortion and so on. When considering about social legal challenges faced by Sri Lankan surrogate mothers, there are so many. I am going to discuss a few in here because of the limited time. Kate Galloway in her paper, Surrogacy and Dignity, Rights and Relationships, stated that women's reproductive situation is never the result of biology alone but of biology mediated by social and cultural organization. The control of women's reproduction role by men is the root of patriarchal oppression. Though I was unable to conduct a field research for this paper uh, due to prevailing situation in the country, this, there are some statistics I gathered in 2017 and you can see those in the screen. I was able to contact 10 surrogate mothers and 52% of them helped their husband's family member or his family friends in surrogacy arrangements. So they become surrogate mothers only to help and only to assist her husband. The, uh, these are not purely based on kindness but sometimes by force. Another challenge faced by the surrogate mothers in Sri Lanka is financial crisis. According to the answers provided by them, 80% of them are unemployed and depending on their husbands. So they have to support their family and they are choosing surrogacy agreements because it's, they think that it is an easy method of uh, gaining money. One can argue that it is okay since they are autonomous. They have their overly autonomy. But uh, the same argument uh, can be to justify uh, prostitution. That is what we need to justify prostitution as well. But not like in prostitution, surrogacy is more complicated. 
because it affect more parties and unborn child also there it was evident through my previous field research this could lead to sexual exploitation you can see the statistic here most of uh, 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 but uh, section 301 of children's act in south africa provides that there should not be financial promises with surrogacy arrangements though it seems to be unjust for women where bodily autonomy is there but on the other hand it is necessary to prevent them from exploitation south african law provide many provisions to protect parties of the surrogacy agreements the main challenge surrogate mothers in sri lanka face is a lack of regulatory mechanism though it is argued that state shouldn't intervene in family issues this issue must be addressed in order to provide the safeguard for surrogate mothers and other parties these are few examples where surrogate mothers mention their financial needs even in the web advertisements this is also one such example the question is to be solved is whether surrogate mothering enhances or restricts freedom at a glance of course yes it enhances freedom it grants women reproductive freedom bodily autonomy and bodily integrity and so on but countries like sri lanka where patriarchy is rooted it is restricting women's freedom and uh, give an extra burden towards women considering their mass baby making and money making machines surrogate mothering can enhance freedom if they can make informed decision by considering all the factors for this purpose there should be a supportive socio legal background so it can be argued that government should intervene in surrogacy agreements neither to promote nor to slander the, because the lack of clear and accurate information on the legal consequences of surrogacy has resulted in cases of exploitation in order to protect sri lankan surrogate mothers there should be some kind of regulatory mechanism like in south africa a regulatory mechanism should be established by the state to ensure the protection of surrogate mothers bodily autonomy and adequate policies to ensure their safety and so social protection finally it is worthy to mention that a state should not uh, let surrogate mothers to be loud used and then forgotten which is happen more often and thank you so much for listening to my presentation and uh, please raise questions if you have any thank you thank you very much uh, ms danushika it's really really a uh, thought provoking uh, presentation and very interesting on uh, regarding surrogacy and uh, i would like to uh, receive the comments from dr ross who just said i hope uh, she would like the presentation because of feminism aspects madam uh, over to you madam <laughs> thank you i know danushik how passionate danushika is about this topic thank uh, you i thought you would make a live presentation uh, it was interesting danushika i read your abstract um now you have done quite a lot of work on this area i know um i have a question for you now this is to challenge you okay right not to not to not to let you down but to empower you through this challenge now you adopt two feminist legal theories to question this liberal feminism radical feminism i am quite comfortable with radical feminism being used to to analyze this whole idea of surrogacy because radical feminists uh, focus on women's bodily integrity the right to uh, bodily integrity and also to have Uh, regulatory framework to safeguard the protection of the right not the protection of the body per se but the protection of the right to bodily integrity so it's a perfect fit but how would you use liberal feminism to to analyze this whole idea actually i use it for man to discuss about the autonomy and integrity all those things but i know that liberal feminism has changed a lot with the time 
uh, I use the uh, earliest concept for this purpose, madam. Now, but I know the contem uh, contemporary libraries have changed their mind and they are talking about something else. So I have to study further on that also. Thank you very much, madam. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Osrijay Sekere, and uh, thank you very much, Ms. Danushika. So our uh, Dr. Yashodara Kadir Gamatambe, she's back on the session now. So, uh, Madam uh, Yashodara, I hope uh, you can hear me. Madam Yashodara, uh, if you are in the session, so I would like to go for, uh, yes, yes. I would like to go for your uh, comments regarding Ms. Janani. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, over to you, uh, madam. Okay, actually, in Danushika's, uh, I have two questions because uh, presentation, she himself stated that right to property or right to land is not recognized in international law. And then second point, what she made was that even in domestic sphere, that right to la land is not given much importance. So given uh, these two arguments, so I have a question about how we can argue on right to land because there is no uh, much acceptance on, you know, international human rights law as well in domestic sphere. So uh, as Dr. Vijay Sekar suggested, I would also say not to use right to land, global right to land. And again, when you take human rights aspect, uh, the um, Janani, I think you have just mentioned Article 17 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I don't know whether you went beyond uh, uh, UDHR and saw there was some controversy when, you know, they drafting the ICCPR and ICSR and they finally, they did not include the right to property in those two conventions because there are a lot of controversies about the definition because they, uh, the many states do not want the private sector coming to, you know, uh, the uh, concept of right to land because uh, as you also pointed out, it is... Uh, the right the land should be with the state because of the you know, state has to balance the interest of private interest and the public interest right then again i would like I would like to also, uh, uh, you can just look into the regional, uh, you know, convention, human rights convention, but again, you can see even if you regional convention, right to property is recognized in American convention, all those, but still you can't say it's a universal right because those are regional instruments where, you know, all these parties. And uh, again, one more comment that when you talk about this uh, right to land, it's uh, because it's related, because human rights are interrelated and indivisible, you know. So therefore, when you, you know, see all literature relating to land rights, uh, it's talk about the other rights, right to housing, right to water, right to food, all those aspects. So therefore, I think right to land, it's uh, the, the proper definition is not given, but again, uh, there are a lot of discussions. There are a lot of discussions uh, which related to other rights. So I would ask you to look into those aspects. Even I would not agree to, you know, use this term uh, global right to lands because uh, the reasons I have pointed out, two reasons. One is the international law. Uh, they still, there is a, uh, you know, uh, no, not kind of an acceptance to recognize right to property and even in the domestic sphere. But certain countries, they have uh, incorporated the constitution. Again, you can look at the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution. Instead of including this right in these two covenants, they passed a resolution and asked the states to include right to property into constitutions and national laws. So those are my comments to your paper. So you can look and, uh, into all those aspects, Janani. Sure, madam. Thank you very much, madam. Even I do agree with that. Uh, even I wanted to emphasize all the rights that are connected to land, not near the, merely own, owning the land. So yes. uh, I think will be uh, the comments are very uh, useful for me to uh, upgrade my uh, research, madam. Thank you very much. Yes, Janani. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yashodara, for your valuable comments on her presentation. And please don't leave the session because uh, we are going to take a photograph of the departmental sessions. Uh, so give me a few minutes and I will arrange everything. So I'm being honored and thankful to our legal luminaries. 
Dr. Ross Vijay Sekar and uh, Dr. Yashodara Kadragam Kambi to participate in our sessions today as the distinguished panel members, uh, do, uh, especially during their very busy working schedule and other commitments. So we really respect and greatly appreciate both of your thoughts, um, both madams, and uh, your contributions uh, given to our presenters uh, in order to develop their research work. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Ross Vijay Sekar and Dr. Shodhara Kadiragam Tambi. Thank you very much, dear madams, for your valuable support uh, to given to uh, the, uh, the, the technical sessions of the Department of Private and Comparative Law. Now, uh, before uh, concluding the session, so I would like to, uh, so we'll, uh, I, as per the request from our head of the department, so we would like to take a departmental photograph, including our dis distinguished panelists. So I would like to ask you to switch on your cameras and we'll have a few minutes to have a snap and uh, then uh, we'll have our word of thanks. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, for presenting for the picture. And uh, so uh, we, we have to conclude the session now. I think it's time, 4 o'clock, 4.10. So uh, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Jayakala Jairendram uh, uh, to uh, give the vote of thanks. And <clears throat> after that, we'll conclude the session. Thank you very much, especially to our distinguished panelists and to our all the presenters. Thank you very much. Jayakala, over to you. A very good evening to all, honorable dignitaries, respected vice chancellor, madam, dean, madam, heads of the departments, distinguished guests, colleagues, dear students and participants. On behalf of the Department of Private and Comparative Law, I feel immense pleasure to take this opportunity to deliver a vote of thanks to conclude the technical session of the annual research symposium 2020 of Department of Private and Comparative Law, Faculty of Law, University of Colombo, to all dignitaries assembled here. I would like to thank our chief guest, Honorable Justice Dr. Salim Masur, President's Council, who spared the time from his busy schedule and honored this event with his inspirational thoughts as the keynote speaker of the inaugural session today. I would like to regard our deep sense of obligation to our respected Vice Chancellor, Senior Professor Chandrika Vijayaradna Madam, for her exceptional leadership, guidance, and motivation. I take this opportunity to specially express my deep regards and gratitude to Professor Indira Nanayakara, Dean of the Faculty of Law, for always encouraging us and providing opportunities to organize such events. I would like to especially thank our respected conference chair of the Annual Research Symposium 2020 of the Faculty of Law, Professor Shanti Sagaraj Singham, for her unfaltering support, guidance, and confidence in us. I would further extend a hearty thanks to Dr. Udapadi Lenage, Head of the Department of Private and Comparative Law for her enormous support and active guidance to make this technical session of the symposium a successful event. I would like to ex express special thanks to the reviewers for their thoughtful comments and efforts towards improving the manuscript submitted by the authors in Department of Private and Comparative Law. I would like to thank the respected panelists of the technical session today, Honorable Justice Esturai Raja, Honorable Justice A.H.M.D. Nawaz, Professor Emeritus Sharias Carnival, Professor Kamina Gunaratna, 
ഡോക്ടർ റോസ് വിജയ ശേഖര് ഡോക്ടർ വിജയദാസ് രാജപക്സ പ്രസിഡൻസ് കൌൺസിൽ മിസ്റ്റർ ജോഫ്രി അലഗറത്നം പ്രസിഡൻസ് കൌൺസിൽ മിസ് ശ്യാമ സൽഗഡു and dr yashodara kadirkam tambi for sparing their time and their thoughts provoking and constructive feedback to the presenters i am sure the feedback given will definitely help the presenters to develop their research papers for the publication i would further extend a hearty thanks to mishalika aryaratna senior assistant registrar faculty of law for her untiring efforts valuable support and guidance in this event I would like to especially thank the staff of the UCSC University of Colombo for all this technical support and for helping us to successfully hold the technical session via Microsoft Teams. My deep sense of appreciation and gratitude go to the organizing committee and the academic and non-academic members of the Department of Private and Comparative Law for their enormous support given in various aspects of this virtual conference in successfully conducting the technical session. last but not the least i take this opportunity to thank all the dignified invitees and the participants who chose to be live with us and attended the technical session of the department of private and comparative law with great enthusiasm and made it a successful event once again i thank you all for being with us this evening have a wonderful day ahead <laughs> thank you the job well done Thank you very much, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, madam. And uh, I must be uh, thankful to Kaushani and Dumindu uh, for being uh, available. And madam, the and madam Budhika also here. Budhika, Budhika also here. Budhika also here. I'm seeing around the clock, uh, but even though she is not presenting, I mean she did she have you know, the best uh, for. Uh,